Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast, is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother, Dagan Moriarty. Dagan, good to see you today, my friend. Um, good to we were talking see before you. the show began just a moment mm-hmm. ago, and I wanted to say this to you. People have, I've read, and some people have written into the show, mm-hmm. my, that my voice has gotten way deeper, even okay. over the last few years. And people have said they've gone back and listened to Sacred Symbols 1, and then listened to it now, and it's like, something happened along the way and I, I was like well i'm probably i'm just more sad probably more you know languishing more i think it's puberty maybe yeah maybe it's puberty it's yeah. finally setting in yeah because um mike, we'll get to mike in a minute but she was saying that you could hear me outside when i'm mm-hmm, podcasting which mm-hmm. is so strange i need to i need to probe more about that but dagan welcome to the show and good to see you and how are you today it's good to see you this ties in with what just happened to me before i came in here to sit with you guys Helene told me that, or she asked me, she put it to me, when am I going to start drinking my coffee like a man? <laughs> That's all she said to me, meaning that I put too much cream in it. Oh. I don't know why it offends her. She doesn't even drink coffee, right? now, And now I'm thinking too, do you guys know this whole thing where somebody commented, I think it was on a Constellation episode about a month ago. I forget what the topic was, but somebody commented in the YouTube, brilliant comment, hilarious. I wish Dagan was more manly. That's all they said. PJ saw it. My best friend saw it. <laughs> oh, and, then that, and then it just opened up this firestorm. He and Helene were talking about it at the wedding, apparently. Now you know what I think? What I think Helene made that comment. Hmm. On YouTube. This <laughs> comes full circle. Yeah. I know what's going on. She's like trying to set the seeds to be... You won't listen to me. You'll probably get upset if this random internet commenter tells you. <laughs> she gave, she gave herself up. away. <laughs> Micah Moriarty now, I guess we can say it. You yeah, go- I mean, I haven't gotten the <laughs> official confirmation yet, but I did go to Social Security and uh, update my last name. So that that change has been put through. And I have a special story for you, Colin, yeah. that I've been waiting. to. Sh- I was saving it for the show. This happened oh, yesterday. We went yeah. to the post office. All right. I know the post office man very well because I go there several times a week. He knew I got married and he said, did you get any of your photos back yet? And I said, oh, we got a couple. And I so I showed him one. And he goes, oh, your husband's a black man, a light-skinned black man? And I was like, no, no, he's, he's Italian. And he's like, oh, they're very spicy. <laughs> and, and But I, it was killing me of, do I tell Colin that this man mistook him for a light-skinned black man? That's or is I'm his ego going to go like through the roof? That's what I'm talking about. So yeah, I was like, yeah, I don't know yeah, if yeah, I should yeah, tell yeah, him or yeah. not. But I said, you know what? I will. I will. I keep, so there it is. <laughs> I keep telling Micah that I'm black now that we got married. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that that makes me black. Hence why and, I didn't I almost didn't tell you. <laughs> and we were and we were searching our we were searching our, our very souls, Dad and I, where I was like, I'm pretty sure, and we said this I think on the show in the past, Micah is the first Moriarty of color. I think that must be true. Right. Mm-hmm. Although we are half Italian, of course we don't get that from the Moriarty side. But how didn't your mom say that I looked like I was Roman or something? Like oh, that? yeah. Oh, yeah. She, 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 I sent her a picture of you when we first started dating. She wanted to know what you looked like. And yeah, she was like, oh, he reminds me of like Mark Anthony or something. I can't remember. I was just like, all I'm right, don't, don't tell him that. I'm telling you. <laughs> you don't deserve any of this yeah. bullshit. This yeah. is crap. Yeah. I never got mistaken for a black man or a Roman. <laughs> <laughs> what crap is this? Gene Park of the Washington Post punching up. Good to see you, my friend. How are you today? Good, good, good. It's, it's funny to hear all these stories. Um, I, I always did wonder what Colin's ethnicity was. I was like, everyone call, everyone keeps calling him like a white supremacist. I was like, I don't, is he white? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, I really think that out of the four of us, well, you now you've seen the four of us, Gene and That's person, true, the yes. siblings. I think I look by far the most Italian of the four of us, but. I don't know if that's true, like most Mediterranean, but even that I have light on me right now that really lightens my skin a lot, but I am pretty dark, actually. You're you're, you're pretty olive skinned for yeah. sure. You know, um, um, I do this because I don't want to be, I don't want anyone to treat me in a racist manner. So I, I want them to think I'm a wasp. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But also to your voice, uh, you know, because I, I, I went back to listen to old Colin content and, I, and I've been doing that for a while now. And I noticed it too. Um, your voice has gotten, have you done voice training before? No, I've not ever. That's incredible because 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 uh, you, you have a very trained voice, and it sounds it sounds more like a radio broadcaster or a podcaster than it ever did before. So it feels like that all those sports podcasts that you listen to have kind of just attached yourself into your own skills and 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 your own ability to present. Am yeah, I? Thank you. Do, do I feel like I, I'm getting that right? Because I I feel like that's my read on on how it you could be. Yeah, your I think own, your skill. It's funny, dude, like uh, we at IGN, there was a time back at the old office. So this was before we even were in San Francisco, where they brought we were doing more and more video reviews and podcasts and stuff. This was probably in like 2008 or something. And they did bring in a voice trainer for the entire like editorial staff. But because I was on strategy guys at the time, I was on mm-hmm. podcast beyond. But because I was on strategy guys, they were like, you don't even need to do this. And apparently people didn't really find it very valuable anyway because it was kind of fast or whatever and kind of generalized but mm-hmm. i think over time i just you it, you certainly it's like we're going to talk about writing later it's certainly like the important the most important part about being a good writer is reading mm-hmm. and the most important part about being a good podcaster i think is listening to other podcasts mm-hmm. not necessarily video game podcasts which i don't listen and i really don't listen to any of them because i don't care but you got to listen to the sports stuff. You got to listen to the political stuff. You got to listen to the philosophical and scientific and all of that. And everyone's got a little something that they can give you. And uh, so, yeah, maybe my presentation has been shaped like that. But I, I found it funny to I was probably I also wasn't the host of those old shows. And I think that that is kind of something worth noting as well. I was always the person being thrown to. Mm. And so maybe I was not as serious or not as staid, not as ready for the show, you know, and much more. And I was younger. And certainly I was more naive and, and all the rest, but I don't know. I got to go. I, I have a big thing about not listening to myself. Like, I don't oh, yeah, like totally, it. Totally. I can never, I, I never listen to any of my own episodes. I never, uh, it's always torture uh, being a journalist and having to uh, re-listen to my own voice as I listen to the interviews that I recorded. Um, that's always tough. Yeah. I hate that. That's why I used to send those out to, um, to, to people that would transcribe them for me yep. or whatever. People yep. with like the weird pedals for people that don't know transcribing audio is one of the most laborious things and it could probably be, be done by AI now, which is hysterical, but it, it is done by, yeah. so, so, so I do that by AI now. So uh, oh, wow. I, I just toss it into uh, uh, what is it? Uh, this program called Trent. I just toss a file in there and then it just automatically transcribes that. So that's how I do all my interviews. I love so that. I actually don't need to listen to my voice anymore because uh, the, the, the transcription will have the words and it'll also have the timestamp too of, of when like I stop, I stop talking and the other person starts talking. So I, I just, I, it's just like a word document. I just jump to the, to the paragraph that, that when, when I know that person's talking and they never hear my voice again. It's great. So Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. I, it's funny, Gene, you would know this, you would remember this because you're, you're a real journalist, is like the audio recorder and then the thing you would hook up to your phone. Mm-hmm. And then you would, you, you, there was, there's a thing you can like buy, like just this little device, you buy like an old Sony audio recorder to like, inter- well, what do you think? See, kind of, like, and then you <laughs> plug it into your phone and every time I, and so that's how you would interview people on the phone and record the conversation. And yeah. every time I did that a million times at IGN and every single time I would make someone call me from the office to make sure I set it up right. You know, because mm-hmm. like you can have the cords in different places. And it's funny how, how quickly things have changed. When I did the history of Naughty Dog, I had I was there for two weeks talking to people. Mm. So I had on the record. Long time. So wow. I had literally probably 500 pages of transcriptions or something insane like that. And mm-hmm. I had to send that out to someone. We had to pay a serious amount of money to get someone to do that because people are like, what's so hard about transcribing? It's that like you have to constantly stop. Mm hmm. So you need to have this very specific setup that people have, usually multiple monitors, but usually it's a foot pedal mm-hmm. that is vital that allows you to like stop and start the audio constantly. Oh, yeah. Without, that could work. Yeah. Without having to like put your hand on a mouse and click it and then put it back on the cursor and then do that. It's like, that's the way they, they do it. And uh, I would, oh my God, that was the worst part about it was, and being an E3 or something and interviewing people, you knew you had to do your own. And that's when I'd had to listen to my own voice. And when we did the anti-Semitism topic a couple of weeks ago. I went and listened to that topic because mm. I was like, I got to make sure that this is just right. And it was great. It was better than I even remembered it, to be perfectly honest, mostly because I was on it. All right. Let's get, let's get into it. Let's see. Here. <laughs> we have an interesting group of topics. Um, Micah, yours is strange. Right, let's start with yours at the top. 
because you obviously yeah. you you em- emerged out of my mind a an old long buried memory of my early career and it's funny that this was something big for th- with you when you were in school because this was something big at IGN um, oh is it yeah so and I had forgot like when you had said you had said so I'll let you set it up obviously but when you had said to me do you remember salad fingers and something in my mind was like salad fingers <laughs> I'm like I know that you know and then I went and, and then I went and looked and I'm like oh I haven't thought of this in so long so take it away my dear Yes. So I have been thinking about Salad Fingers recently because it popped up again on YouTube. Salad Fingers was a viral animated video. There's a series of them. And they started when I was a freshman in high school. And it was just one of those things, though, that like it went nuts. Everybody was watching it. You'd come to school and everyone would be like, did you see the new Salad Fingers? Like everybody was talking about it. The problem was that I was terrified of it, but I didn't want to tell my friends that. So I would end up watching it. I really didn't like it. I thought it was very scary. But then I got to a point where they were so horrifying, they were giving me nightmares. I stopped watching it. And then I had to pretend I'd seen it because I didn't want to be the lame one. I didn't want to tell people, oh, salad fingers is scary. So I end up just going to school and it's like faking it till I make it of like, I'm just going to keep telling people, yeah, I saw the new salad fingers. What do you, well, yeah, that, that was funny. But it, it just was one of those things that I couldn't believe how popular it was because it was just so weird. And I asked you guys to watch the first episode of Salad Fingers called Spoons. Because it's just one of those things that it still sticks out in my mind. My friends and I still quote it. They don't know that I didn't like it the whole time. Like they still had no idea that Micah actually was kind of afraid of salad fingers. But my sister and I even still quote it. We'll be having conversations and we'll still throw in a salad fingers line here and there because she was two years older than me. And it was the same thing at her school, though. Everybody was watching it. It was that era of we're all kind of figuring out that like YouTube has wacky and like zany stuff on it. And then here's this strange undercurrent of weird animations and our parents don't know if we should be watching it. It was just an entire thing. And I just still look back on it and say, like, I don't know how this got so popular. It's so strange. But I wanted to do the topic with this group because of the age differences between us. I wanted to know if this was something you'd ever seen. Because like for Dagan, I think this came out either the year Lilia was born or Mm -hmm. even prior. So it's like this is something that's as old as your oldest child, for example. So I was curious if you guys had seen it, if you remembered the phenomena (laughs) and if it was something that you if you hadn't seen it, I just want to know like what your reaction to this bizarre video is. So I'd like to start with Dagan the animator, of course. Had you ever seen this video before? Had you ever seen any of these before? I don't know what pop culture or animation rock I was hiding under, but I've ne- <laughs> I had never seen this before. <laughs> Micah, I was, I was stunned last night. And this is a guy that, you know, came out of the tradition. Like I know Newgrounds. I know, you know, prior to the internet, we had Spike and Mike's twist. You used to work for festival, some of this. So I'm no stranger the- to, you was, know. Dick, hold on. I was going to say, you used yeah. to work for one of the major online animation like pre.com oh yeah, yeah so like you're, i work you, for a lot of them yeah so you like you definitely know that's why i'm surprised to hear that because you definitely know this space like this is the kind of shit you would yeah do. i created content for right. new grounds at va- not independently but at various studios i will say oh. one thing i mean for, i have so many so many things to say first of all this hit really perfectly for me micah because it was last night i got the email late i mean it was like 1 30 in the morning so i watched it you know the house was quiet everybody was asleep i was legitimately freaked out i had i had never seen you know like i'm no stranger to this kind of vibe the indie spirit scary things i think of like the brothers quay or jan Svonkmeyer. like there i've seen horror animation before or at least kind of like the animation equivalent of like a david lynch film but this one especially this first episode this hits different like this is a genuine vision of creepiness and i i looked up the guy david firth like I, he's got some demons man like this guy i hope he's getting therapy but like let's put it that way. i went and watched a couple of the later ones just so i could i think i watched the first one and then i watched like 11 and i think 12 is the newest one and there were years in between some of these things yes. but just so i could bookend it and at least get some sort of you know some sort of read or a beat on things but 
The thing that one of the early things I thought of after watching it and kind of taking it in a couple of times is that my class of animators, like the people that graduated from school in the late 90s, we were kind of the last generation of the traditionally trained, very reverent coming up in this tradition of Walt Disney. You know, we were animating on, you know, with pencil and paper, Disney's Nine Old Men, classic techniques, old Warner Brothers masters like Ken Harris and Chuck Jones. We were kind of the last vestige of that because right after we graduated in the late 90s, it went all computer. So we were tail end the traditional early adopters of the computer. And my generation, we did avail ourselves of like newer animation styles and the software and the hardware and stuff. But there was a snobbishness. Like I worked for Newgrounds and refused to watch the channel just because I thought the animation was so cheap and low rent that I was like, I'm, I'm, we're, we're above this. You know what I mean? Like that, I didn't, I don't think I've ever gone like onto Newgrounds and watched anything intentionally. You know, like there was a, there was a total air of like, we're better than this. And I think the generate, the two generations that came right after us in school, two or three generations, I would, they would probably argue with that, that they weren't steeped in the same traditions, but we definitely had, we were the last generation to miss this stuff, I think, you know, so going back, it was interesting to see what was going on and also to see how big it was, 45 million views. This thing's like 16 years old. Now, did you guys first see this on YouTube or Newgrounds? Oh, this was YouTube for me. Like, okay. I remember going to school and somebody saying, you have to watch this. And they bring it up on their phone and we were watching it on YouTube. And this was, though, like, YouTube was still new for us. Like, I'm a freshman in high school. And it's like we were getting into the sort of like the viral videos like Fred. Uh, well, I was a huge fan of Fred or Charlie the Unicorn, all those types of things. But it was, it's like for us, that's like what YouTube was at the time was just like, here's silly internet videos. It was completely not what it is now. Like, hey, you can find tutorials and actual real information about topics. And like, you know, it was just stupid internet videos, people falling down. Like that was what it, that's all it was to us. But so yeah, I found that on YouTube. We did watch like a lot of Newgrounds stuff. One of my favorite videos ever. And this is this is I'm saying this is pre Bill Cosby scandal. There's a, yeah. a cartoon of Bill Cosby eating a, a popsicle, but he like he just keeps eating the same popsicle over and over. And the joke was that like, oh, you wait and see if he gets any bigger and he never does. But like you sh- you have someone watch it. You're like, just just wait and watch it. He'll get bigger. And they'll sit there and watch it for five minutes before they realize, wait a minute, he's the same size. But like we loved that stupid shit. So yeah, for us, this was a YouTube thing, but we, okay. we totally were watching silly stuff on Newgrounds as well. I could see kids being horrified by that. I mean, this is actually, <laughs> there's something about just the way he wove this all together. Like there's something about the static over everything, the specific music, the timing. It's ve- it, had a, it had like a weird, a lot of that stuff was comedic. But this is just dark. You know, it's so dark that it's almost it almost brings out a certain flavor of humor. But I thought like the way everything was woven together almost intentionally, even the glitchy things like there's a walk cycle that maybe he motion tweened and the the lead leg drags a little bit. So it kind of falls out of sync and there's there's something creepy about that. Like it's it's really masterfully put together in a way to really feel disturbing. I thought it, it felt a little bit like, it reminded me for some reason of the pederast neighbor in Family Guy with like <laughs> an Invader Zim vibe to it. I was just like, this is, but it's its own, but the, the, oh, those like the old man. Yeah, and he does sa- he does sound like the old man from, from Family Guy. Right, he has that creepy. Oh, oh that old man, yeah. It, yeah. Malevolent <laughs> yeah. underneath, yeah. you know, like just twisted. Paper. Yeah, that, yeah, that kind of, yeah, exactly. There's something about it. You know, I loved it. I mean, I just, I think the vibe is so good. I Even looking at later pieces, though, there's a purity to this first one. Like, I think you could see later on Firth, like, incorporated maybe a little After Effects. It gets very visual effects heavy. It gets, it gets more polished. But this first one is so raw that there's a, there's, there's a purity in it. And again, it was taking out of, like, this was the first time outside of the independent film festivals where you could do things and just have a captive audience, you know, vis-a-vis the internet. So 
Yeah, man. I just, I thought this was really cool. I looked up David Firth's sort of his filmography to see what he's done, and he hasn't really done that much. You know, you think, I guess he could be, you know, he could be independent and do well just on with, you know, by his YouTube channel. But usually these guys are thrust into some sort of TV, you know, the networks will come and snatch him up or something. But he seems to have stayed, um, I think, a couple of music videos. But besides that, he seems to have stayed independent through the years, which is interesting. Well, and another thing I'll note as well is that I don't remember really seeing merch for this. And, and I, because I remember seeing like other things would kind of go viral, like Fred, for example. And you see kids with Fred shirts, like he really took off. And you would see kids wearing that type of stuff, or like Charlie the Unicorn, even all the time. Yeah. But I don't really remember seeing kids wearing Salad Fingers stuff, despite how popular it was. Now you can Google it now, and you can, there is merch for it. But just to say that it's not something I distinctly remember seeing kids wearing, even though we were all talking about it. It was extremely popular. You couldn't avoid avoid it. We all were making the same rusty spoons joke at school. Like it just really was this huge thing, but I don't remember kids actively buying merch for it if it existed at the time. And that kind of was felt like a disconnect between it was so popular, but it wasn't like the hot topic level of popular where oh they have salad finger stuff now. It was like, oh, you bought a shirt that some guy made on eBay type thing, oh. you know, but it just at least that's how I remember it of kids weren't wearing this stuff all the time like they were with other viral stuff that the guy actually made merchandise out of. So, so it's so but, interesting. And it, it, it does just get weirder and weirder. I Like the second episode is actually my favorite one. And that one takes a very dark turn in which I believe Salad Fingers is like having a hallucination and it's because his oven was running. And like the door to it was like open. It was a whole thing. But it's and it's it's like that's the type of stuff, though, that we were watching, even though I found it deeply unsettling. But there was something enticing about it. Gene, my man, let's go in descending order of age, shall we? Gene, did you have you seen this before or was this new to you? I did see Salad Fingers before. When you sent me the link, I was like, oh, this thing. I, I, I'm not familiar with it because I never watched uh, the, the whole thing. But I did remember the first episode. And I remember I was like, okay, that's cool. And I, I never really continued it. Because um, I was, what well, this came out in 2004, but it was uploaded to YouTube in 2007. So I was pretty much in a time where I was not that online. Um because this was right after college and I moved back to Guam uh, where like I was mostly concerned about doing things like drugs or <laughs> clubbing and stuff like that. Um, so I wasn't really spending a lot of time in online message boards or like online communities at the time. Uh, even in 2007 when, when, when it came on YouTube, I think I, I saw it on YouTube and then I just moved on. But, you know, but even today, I don't really watch uh, like online web series um you know i used to read penny arcade uh the the, the web comic that obviously spawned into this huge massive event series called pax now um but then i i just gave up on that and then that was kind of uh, uh, my engagement to like web comics and like web animation and new grounds too like i i used to watch stuff by aaron, aaron hansen uh, game grumps right um which mike know whom mike knows very well too yes um but uh, this reminds me of the current uh, hot web series that is very, very popular with Gen Z called Skibby D Toilet. Have you guys heard of it? I don't know. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skibby D Toilet is like the new, the, the new web series that is like, uh, like just lighting up the internet. Um, you might hear it uh, as a meme, uh, just, just as a reference uh, of like nonsense because Skibby D Toilet sounds like absolute nonsense. And it is. Uh, it, it's a cartoon series about a, a, a head in a toilet. I guess his name is Skibby D, and they go into like 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 this huge like World War Three scenario with like other creatures or whatever, and it's all uh, animated in the Half Life Source Engine, which is the the, the amazing thing. Um, so it's not a two D animation; it's all three D animation, and it's all like a complete nonsense. Um, <laughs> And that's what internet human humor has been. It's it's very it, it's very nonsensical. It's very surrealistic, very absurdist and dadaistic. You know, um, Salad Fingers it, it, it obviously just stems from like a step an inside joke, and it just made more insane. 
um, you know, millennial humor uh, has always been kind kind of this way. Uh, you, you look at Eric well Andre, said. you know, it, it, the, the, the Eric Andres and the uh, even your Conan O'Briens you know, with, with the masturbating bear and mm-hmm. stuff like that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> You well, know, the, 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 the humor has a has a has a linear DNA. Comedy has a linear DNA. I feel like uh, when I see Salad Fingers, I was like, "Oh, this is the beginning of like this weird animation, uh, the, the, this weird like surreal storytelling, kind of like you know, like an ARG or, or or something a little mysterious." And that's what Skibby D Toilet is too. It's, it's it's also a little mysterious and a little strange and you know, a little impenetrable to, to, to generations to watch. Cause if you, if you even if you show uh, uh salad fingers to like a, a 60 year old, they wouldn't understand it today. Right. Um, but when I saw it, I was like, Oh yeah, I remember this. This was, this was interesting and, 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 and intriguing enough for a lot of people to watch. It's just for me. I just never watched a lot of web series. It was mostly like red versus blue, uh, that the, the halo series. That was what, what I watched, but I needed like, I don't. I don't really enjoy surrealistic uh, web series as much as uh, some people do. But it's fun. It's cute, and it's it's a good source of memes. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and it's always it's always fun to see how 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 uh, internet humor has been uh, evolving over the years. Um, reminds me of of how we can just never kind of get rid of this humor. It's always like just literally in our in our DNA in in our blood. I'm reminded of a of of a, of a, of a of a of a like I guess an experiment a couple of years ago, I think in 2017, where scientists were actually able to encode a GIF into bacteria. Uh, they were actually you can actually store information into uh, like big bacteria. So they actually injected a GIF of a horse running into <laughs> a, 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 a single cell of of a bacteria of E. coli. What? Um, so I, we're just a few years away from being able to literally inject memes into our bloodstream, you know? Oh, hell yeah. I want to be you made know? out of memes. Yeah. yeah. Memes memes can literally become genes soon, you know? Which is why I love <laughs> which is why I love my name, Gene Park. You know? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Despite yeah. all my memes, I'm just a rat in some genes. <laughs> 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 no, Gene, you bring up a really great point about like millennial humor, which of course, even just like millennials, it's such a, such a wide age bracket because mm-hmm. Colin and I, when we first started dating, I sent Colin some very bizarre memes that I found hysterical and he didn't think they were funny at all. What The yeah. first one being, when I was a guest on Sacred Symbols Plus, Colin said, can you send me a picture of you to use for the thumbnail? And I sent him a photo of me and then I also sent him a picture of a tortilla on a toilet paper holder. And he didn't reply. He didn't like think it was funny. <laughs> it was only after we started dating. I was like, do you remember when I sent you that picture of the tortilla in the bathroom? And he was like, it wasn't funny. <laughs> but like that, that image <laughs> makes me like cry laugh. <clears throat> and, or I, I sent him as well. There was a picture of like a rubber spatula on the toilet paper holder. Like and just and he didn't think any of these things were funny. I have a picture of it's a tree stump with mashed potatoes on it. And it says decorative stump, and I mean that picture gets me going every time. It's Colin doesn't I mean, think it's funny. These, like, you just have too you have too <laughs> wide range of. I'm I'm frankly just more sophisticated than that. No, yeah. no, it's your <laughs> lack of sophistication. If you don't think potatoes on a tree stump is funny, I, I can't explain it to you. But it's true that like I remember my mom seeing salad fingers and be like, "What is that?" Yeah, and it's just like you can't explain it. You know, because she really liked some of the other things that we watched, really surprisingly, but not that one. That was just too far. She didn't get it. She didn't want to get it. And it was this. It also just reminds me of there were some shows I remember like on like network television, like Cartoon Network had a really weird show called The Problem Solvers, which only got one season because it was too weird. But they just were off the walls. It was like a YouTube show, but just they put it on TV. And it was it was almost just a bridge too far. The kids were like, I don't know about this one, man. <laughs> it's but it be was on the internet. It, it, well, that was the thing of yeah, it just didn't feel like a TV show. It was yeah. like they they're yelling and mm-hmm. they're like colors flashing on screen all the time. They're they would just shout out absurd phrases. You know, it was just like it felt like this actually would have worked if it was on YouTube, but watching it on TV felt strange. So it didn't catch on. 
but it is this this like kind of span of like what makes millennial humor mm -hmm. is very interesting to me obviously i love memes i love meme culture but this yeah salad fingers still being so quotable too. something my sister and i still will send each <laughs> other little texts just about salad fingers colin my dear mm. my husband though mm. tell me styled fingers what what does this mean to you now you're not the biggest fan of animated content either but i want to know like so you said you didn't in, indeed remember this oh yeah and no, I'm, I, I'm glad yeah i'm actually glad you know we had you know most of you guys didn't know what this was so tell me about your experience with it yeah so like i said it when sometimes you just forget i, I mean i forget almost everything that happens so <laughs> So you, you, someone says something that's just that direct linear path towards that memory. And I'm like, yes, I know that turn. I don't know why I know. It. And then, so when I sat and watched the link, yeah, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember this. And it reminds me, like I say, I mean, it comes up a lot is my, my days in media, just because we used to gather around in the office. It was mm -hmm. so common for people to gather around people's computers, specific, specific people, especially, uh, my old friend Dave Clayman and a lot of the guys in the video team, Nick Scarpino was a great example of this because they would always find the weirdest shit. And we were kind of on the forefront of trying to figure out what to even do with it, to compete with it, to try to absorb it. A good example of this is uh, people might know that the YouTube videos from Bro Team, um, which were like these really popular YouTube videos. And we were really early to them there and used to like gather around and think they were their videos were hysterical. And I think we actually bought a bunch of their videos at IGN. And frankly, this kind of thing also reminds me of my sphere of Mega 64. And I don't mm -hmm. know why why that came to mind for, but it does because those were the kinds of videos we used to gather around um, for as well. And we worked with them a lot at IGN too. And they were always really nice. But they were like just weird, surreal, more live action, more my, more in my lane, just weird, sh just doing weird shit, like dressing up as metal, you know, as solid snake and going to the supermarket or doing whatever it is they used to do. And it's funny because they're still, I think they're still going. And um, it reminds me of another kind of surreal, weird thing that I watch sometimes that I've shown you, although briefly, Micah, is G.I. Joe Berg, which is <laughs> this somewhat popular YouTube channel that does like a G.I. Joe aura, like a, a real American hero style podcast, but then does these live action scenes with things but they're kind of funny live action scenes and the, the, with the toys where their hands are like in the shot moving the vehicle forward it's hysterical. and like, it's really really cool and the, the figures are all talking to each other and and it's very just deadpan and i dig that kind of humor i dig weirdness and i dig weirdness where you kind of have to just go with it it doesn't always hit like that's that's the important thing about being weird i think is that some things are just not funny to some people, like no matter how much you want them to be. And then some things just get you right in the gut that other people don't understand or do. And I think that that's kind of the brilliance of, of humor. And I personally enjoy a lot of different sorts of humors. I think I'm a, a type of humor. I'm eclectic in that sense. But um, what this reminds me of in this era of creation reminds me of a lot is what got me into it in the into creation in the first place was just the completely complete erasure of barriers to where it's like, okay, I, I can just literally do whatever I want. And then if it finds its way, it, it finds its way. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And this is just one of probably a bajillion examples of that, ultimately, that make the internet so special. I always joke around about how I want the Chinese to, you know, to, to detonate the EMP already and just be done. So we can just be off the internet and we can finally fight the third world war and we can just go, let's just get it over with. But in, in all seriousness, it's the internet has been a great boon towards human creativity and has allowed, like you had brought up Gene, the term absurd, uh, absurdism and, and surrealism. I'm a, in terms of fine art, surrealism is like my genre. I love that shit. I have original surrealist art in my house. Um, and so it all kind of emanates from the oddity and the weirdness of seeing things through a different lens. And it kind of goes full circle, Mike, into something you and I both really like, although I can only take it in, in small amounts, which is, so I think you should leave. These, yes. these are all the same in a yeah, lot of different so ways. Good. This, this really all is. goes into, again, I bring it up all the time, the Spielbergian, like there are six stories thing. Like there are, there's only so many ways you can even do what you want to do. That's why it's so interesting when there's a truly unique idea because everything is derivative. And it's not even about remakes and series and all that. Everything is just derivative. A love story, uh, a, a story of revenge, a uh, story the of redemption. Journey. The hero's right, journey, like, right? It's, right, hero's journey. All those kinds. Of, it's like, that's it. The, people, the, these are so oft done that there are literal, <clears throat> almost mathematical equations to them. 
like about how they grow and how the arc works and what happens and all that. And so this just fits into another lane of that. And for me, Dave, I thought you'd appreciate it. It reminds me a little bit of liquid television too, just in the sense of liquid television for people that don't know is like MTV's very early animation stuff. And a lot of that was fucking weird too. Oh yeah. Yeah. The max. Yeah. Right. Absurd. Exactly. And so I can love that show, man. The the cool thing for, for me about surrealist humor and weird humor is you just have got the, the creators have to believe in it and put their shoulder into it and under no circumstance let up. And then it's either going to work or it doesn't. I think about uh, a show, um, I don't know, like Trailer Park Boys, even where it's like, this is so silly. But the point is, is that you can never really acknowledge it. You just have to keep doing it. They get out. They go to jail every year. They get out of jail every year. They're back at the park. They're all this crazy shit. It doesn't make any sense. Like you have to just it's so above and beyond. It's daring you to even think carefully about it because it, it would it would undo all of it. And so I guess that's kind of a, a little too philosophical and deep, deep, but maybe not for something like Salad Fingers. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I, I love it. And I think it's important. Again, other pieces of lineage for for humor like that would be like Monty Python. Yeah. And sh- it's just all. Sure in the same soup. So I did. You guys ever watch uh, wonder shows in the old MTV show? Sure. Yeah. yeah. You watch yep. that one? Yeah. Uh, it's always funny to see Gen Z kids uh, discover it and discover the clip. Um, we got to celebrate our differences. Do you, do you remember that bit? Let me, let me see. Uh, it was yeah. a song uh, where it goes, we got to celebrate our differences. And it shows a bunch of Chinese people. And it goes, ching, chong, ching, chong, ching, ching, chong, ching, chong, ching. <laughs> and it says, we got to celebrate our differences. And it just shows a bunch of African black people. And it goes, ooga, booga, ooh, ooga, booga, ooh. I got to watch this. And then next one is a bunch of Mexicans. And it goes, nacho taco. Taquito chimichanga. I gotta watch this. And it's like you you had to be there to to understand that. I'm sorry, you know. (laughs) That was the bridge. Wonder Shows and was the bridge from like early 90s MTV liquid television to the internet. You know, it kind of kept that whole surrealist, you know, it's just it's so weird when you create content like this. Like Colin was saying with with Trailer Park Boys, a good example. It's adhering to a vision. No matter how bizarre that vision is, when there's a consistency and sort of a genuine approach to it, it just hits. Yeah, totally. Like, why would this hit? Workaholics is the same. Same oh, thing. Oh, I love yeah. Workaholics. Same yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. Actually, I remember Workaholics. Holy crap. It's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, but it taps into something visceral. It's so, it's so weird. Like, I love, and I love Gene's point about, like, really, I think that's the thing I'm, I'm saying from an animation perspective like the few, like Gen Gen X, like such a small fraction of us were actually animators, right? So we had this whole philosophy of like, this is beneath us. And there was like a resentfulness almost. Mm. Like we're we're trained, we're we're skilled, went to school for this, we worked our whole lives to be animators. So this poorly designed, poorly animated, low rent content that's getting millions of eyeballs. It's like, it's not fair. It's the wrong way to think of it, but that's how we thought about it in our 20s. We were like, this is fucked up. We're working on this TV show, killing ourselves for a fraction of the eyeballs, you know, but there's something about that independent that's so cool about that the independent artist can now be seen, but there's something in that vision that's just authentic. It's weird. It's, it's legitimately weird, but we must all be a little weird to respond to it. You know what I mean? Because it's salad fingers are strange. Like the guy's obsessed with rust. He's maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe like a, mol- a, a child molester. He kind of acts like it's weird. You know, he's coming in there with the kid. The kid looks horrified. <laughs> there's something just, there's something so good about the way it's put together and something so raw about this first video. Because I think I was watching number 11, which was interesting and higher production values and stuff, but it just went on and on. This is less than two minutes long. I love that. It's short and sweet and it hits a vibe and it just, it resonates. It's weird that it hits, but it does. And it holds up. Like this holds up. This is old. Yeah, the, yeah. the biggest thing to me was that 
the chill I felt when I watched it because I hadn't actually seen this video in years. And as soon as I put it on and his mouth starts moving and I was just like, I remember being terrified <laughs> all over again, like because it just was so scary to me it was creepy, at the yeah, time. I can, I can get it's why you, you weren't into it, you know. Well, I, the, I would also I pretend had, to like it too, probably. <laughs> you know? I had very little exposure to horror when I was younger because just so much of it just wasn't allowed. So it just was like, this was genuinely scary. And you just kind of, you couldn't put your finger on what the worst part was. Like I'm looking at the picture of Sal it's like his eyes are red. There's the big bags under him. His mouth looks stitched shut. Like they're just, as they mentioned, his walk is all weird. Like there were just so many things. The, yeah, the other character like doesn't really speak. He just kind of screams. It was just... <laughs> It was so deeply unsettling. And I remember being afraid when someone would say there was a new one. And I'd be like, I have to watch it. Like, you know, and just seeing this again for the first time, maybe since high school, did bring back those memories of, wow, this was so scary when I was 14. It also reminds me of Marble Hornets, the old old, uh, YouTube horror show that eventually spawned the, the, the myth, the mythical creature Slenderman. Which oh, uh, yes. fingers look, well, looks a lot, lot like too. You know? yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, I, I see. Oh, a, I see yeah. definitely a relationship between that's Slenderman a good pull. and Mr. Slenderman and Mr. Salafingers too, and they're both a little creepy, a little bit like horror based too. Uh yeah, yeah. Slenderman is definitely scary uh, to the max. That I, I didn't like that one bit. I didn't need any of those copy pastas and whatnot. I was like, have we done alone. a creepy pasta topic? No, I don't know. I don't think we have yet. The whole the whole notion of you like that we all know what creepy pasta is is a, an example of just evolving generational humor. It makes me wonder mm-hmm. what people found funny a long time ago, and I mean a long time ago, and probably they. And isn't it interesting? And this is a whole other topic and a total ancillary thing. But who were like the funniest people back then? Was there were there mm-hmm. people in Rome or? wherever where they're like, that dude that motherfucker is funny you know <laughs> did they, did, i know they didn't do stand-up and the stuff but, Chappelle of, of caesar's empire right. you know because <laughs> there was like uh we talked about it a few weeks ago the the the, the philosopher that like lived like a pot like basically in a sh- in a fucking bucket or something like that and was t- do you know gene weren't you and i talking about that on the show maybe it wasn't with you there was like an old greek or roman philosopher whose entire thing was like he lived this absurd ridiculous life where he lived like on the street and he would give people crazy advice and all that i can't remember his name people will know what i'm talking about and maybe that's the closest they have towards what i'm thinking of but it's interesting humor where does it even come from it's part of consciousness i guess but we do know like our dogs find things delightful or fun it's not they don't i don't know if they know if it's if it's funny so I don't know. It's so interesting to think about that and where that even comes from and what people thought was oh funny. God, back no, in the day. yeah, yeah. Because I, I know my cat is having fun. He's having a good time. Right. But he doesn't have, does he have the sophistication to know that something is funny, you know? And, and, and that's what separates us, I guess, from the rest of the shaft of, 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 of living things, I guess, you know? Uh, that's a good point. Like, it, it's, a, it's a bit like love, you know? It, 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 the humor, humor and, and love are, are very similar emotions and feelings that we feel that are so, that feel so unique to us you know? yeah that's true they're almost as inexplicable as each other too mm-hmm. in the sense that where you laugh until you cry it's like what is going on why is my body yeah. reacting like this like mm-hmm. i am so overjoyed by this or something in some way it's crazy it's interesting or uh i and uh, you know what i'm posing this to the medical listeners of last stand. I'm not asking for medical advice, but Colin, you just remind me when I laugh really hard, my arms stop moving mm. and no doctor <laughs> has ever been able to tell me why. Yeah. When and she, so, when she yeah, it gets like hysterical, like she can't move her arms. <laughs> yeah. They just completely stop. I can't move my Which arms. Which is in and of itself and, funny. And the, well, cause <laughs> right, cause the, the real party <laughs> trick is to try to hand me something while I'm doing that. And then I laugh even harder and then I just like still can't move my arms or my hands. Or like if you try to take something from my hands, cause they're like kind of like locked shut. It's, and that's, see, that's been happening since I was a child. I'm going to give our, if there's any doctors in the audience or even a nurse, I'll settle. I, since I was a child, if I laugh really hard, my arms stop moving. I never told anyone this because oh. I thought it happened to everybody. It was just one of those things that I thought, yeah, everybody has that thing where you, you laugh so hard, your arms don't move. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I said that to someone and they were like, that's not how bodies work. And I said, <laughs> oh, 
Well, it's what happens to me. Little context. I had lead poisoning as a child. I don't know if that. <laughs> that's a lot of oh, context right? for a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, that but explains it, you know, that explains 90% of it, I would say. <laughs> yeah, <just> generally. <laughs> If there's any doctors in the audience, a nurse practitioner, a holistic shaman of some kind, you know, if this if this sparks anything in you, let me know, because I've never gotten an answer. It's not dangerous. I don't believe I mean, don't make me laugh when I'm driving. That's a rule. But um, otherwise, I don't oh, think yeah. it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, that would but, be but no, I, I would just if there's any doctors out there listening to this. Let, let me know if that is that sparks anything in your knowledge, because I'm just curious. I'm just curious. A medicine man of sorts. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, are you satisfied? Absolutely. No, this was a fun little discussion. And I want to say too, for the, the listeners, if you want an example of a video that Colin absolutely hated, but I thought was really funny. If you go on YouTube and type in Philip Solo busy tonight, and it's him, it's Philip Solo, who's really funny. And he's asking 100 Uber drivers if they're busy tonight. So like he gets into the car and he just keeps saying like busy tonight, but he's wearing different outfits and he's doing accents and like it's really funny. And I sent that to Colin at one point when we were dating and he they didn't like it at all. He said he only watched it for like 15 seconds, <laughs> whereas I've watched this video several <laughs> times. I laugh until I cry like every time and Colin just wasn't having it. So if you want like an example of this, the difference in our humor, that's a perfect well, one there's, to th watch. There's like a, we have a, you know, the Venn diagram of our humor, the type of things we yeah. love. It's There's a huge overlap, but the part, oh, absolutely. That, the part that, you, that doesn't overlap for you is so bad that I can't <laughs> believe that it's even part of the circle itself. You know what he, I mean? So he just, you have to get it. Like he gets into the car <laughs> and he just keeps saying busy tonight. And then like he does, he like he's dressed as like a witch and he's like busy tonight. And then like there's one of them, where he's like has a turkey and he's asking <laughs> if they're busy tonight. Like that's the whole thing. He just keeps getting in the car. And as funny as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on. We'll keep the serious stuff to the back end to the B side. So dig, let's go to you. This actually is, I think, somewhat linear. In fact, since we're talking about creativity, I like we all it. fancy ourselves writers in some way. Mm -hmm. um, Gene's probably the only real writer at this point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's actually true. Uh, yeah. Go on, Dave. Uh, hit me with yeah, it. Yeah. So writing, I mean, this is the great group, a great group for this. And I wanted to do this topic. This is one of those topics that just occurred to me. It wasn't, hasn't been on my list for a long time, but writing in general just keeps coming up for me over the last week or so. So I said, you know what? Let me do a topic on writing. And then when I found out it was going to be Gene and Mike, I said, this is a good group. This is kind of a captive audience for this. I mean, writing for me, I think Colin knows this, but it was something that came along a little later because my interest in art was, you know, dates back to as far back as, as I can remember being a kid. But something that happened to me in high school that was weird because I never really thought about, I never thought about writing at all. I mean, I wrote book reports as a kid and stuff like that, but I never thought about writing like I thought about it, you know, as far as drawing it was something that I enjoyed until high school. I was in 10th grade and I had an English teacher that Colin would have a decade later too, named Mrs. Parry. And it was, you know how it started with her? I took a creative writing elective, sort of like this class that I had to kind of nestle into my schedule. It's the first time I ever had her. So we didn't know each other prior. And I was in this creative writing class and I think our first assignment was to write a short story and it had to be a horror thing. And I think everybody had to choose a writer, like let's say you went with Stephen King or a different horror writer and said, you know, write a story like this, like this author would write a story. So I picked Edgar Allan Poe and I wrote this weird story and it was the first time I ever really wrote anything creatively. And she liked it and she kind of came to me after class one day and was like, I want, you know, like you, I know you're, she, you know what it was, Kyle? She was very good friends with my art teacher, my high school art teacher, Mr. Fight. And I guess she already knew that I was on a track to become a professional artist. I was super into comics. I was super into anime. So I was super into my art. And she knew that by approximation of Mr. Fight. So she came to me and said, I know you're, you know, you're an art student and you want to go to art school and stuff, but you're really, you know, she, I remember her saying this to me. She was like, you're a writer. And she's basing this off of one short story. So she said, I want you with me, you know, for all my classes. So in 11th grade, 
I think I took AP English and then it was honors English or maybe vice versa. So I was with her for the rest of high school. And she really took me under her wing. And, you know, I read all the great novels under her and also really learned how to write. Like she formed me as a writer and she, she kind of taught me to appreciate writing and be mindful of it. And it was something that I enjoyed. I ended up writing fiction for the school newspaper and stuff like that. So it was a, it was a cool journey, but I think. I always saw writing as something I enjoyed and Mrs. Perry brought that out of me, but there was just something about art that I was going to stick to it. And of course I ended up going to art school and I wanted to be an animator and the whole thing. So I left school and went to college and my first year of college, I took, we had to, it was a weird sort of trajectory for my art education because I majored in animation right away. I didn't have to take foundation in fine art or anything like that. But we had to fill up our schedule. I guess the trade-off was we had to fill up our schedule with a lot of electives. So I remember everything from like a documentary film class, a live action film class, film theory. I took US history at some point. I took like pre-algebra. And it, somewhere in there, I had a, another creative writing class. And I had a teacher. I remember she was really cool. She was very bohemian. She dressed like really hippy dippy, very new agey. She was really cool though. And she, you know, thinking back, she was young. She was probably only 10 years older than me at the time. So maybe she was like late 20s, early 30s. I wrote my first thing in her class. I don't remember if it was a series of poems or if it was a short story, but the same exact thing happened to me. She came to me and was like, I know you're in school for animation, but like you're a writer. It was the same thing. It echoed exactly what happened to me in high school. And that, then that gave me pause. I was like, all right, this is two times this happened to me. It's really strange. So it was the same thing. I just kept kind of going with my art education, but there was something sort of, you know, she, she woke something up in me or re, re woke something up in me where it was like, all right, this writing thing keeps coming up. I don't know what it is. I know I enjoy it, but it was kind of strange because it wasn't really something I worked at or anything like that. It wasn't like art where I was doing it my whole life, right? It was a new thing. So it was the same exact thing. And then I ended up writing a little bit professionally during college. I wrote various articles and a couple of short stories for different skate magazines. Like I did something for a, a Philly-based magazine that my friends ran called Journal. I did a couple of things for Slap Magazine, RIP. But by and large, I wasn't really a professional writer. I just did things here and there. So I get out of, I get out of college. And because I like to write and because I think more – more by proxy my creativity, I ended up writing a lot throughout my animation career here and there. Like I would write outlines for or treatments for stuff I wanted to pitch. Maybe I would write or outline the odd episode for a show I worked on or just brainstorm ideas. So there was some writing going on in my career. And it was something I thought of that was labor intensive and demanded a lot of concentration, but not something as hard or time consuming as animation, you know, drawing 24 frames a second or whatever, even on the computer, like even doing bad animation is requires a lot of toil. I always thought of writing as a little different. Like you could kind of jump in and jump out, even though it's difficult, it doesn't take as much time. And I felt there was something rewarding about that. So lately, especially because 2023 was so hard, you know, on again, off again in animation, working a little bit, then you're off for a while. It's been a pretty tumultuous year for my career. I've been thinking a lot about, is there a way I could segue into writing professionally full time? You know, over the last 10 years, I've written for, written reviews and reflections for, a, a, you know, a few video game books. So got paid to write, but again, nothing regular, not like Gene, you know, where that's my job, like that's my career. So I've been flirting with this thing of like, how do I tap into writing for, you know, writing and animation? This is, this is a world I know. So it just so happens that the animation studio I'm working for right now, I sort of, I sort of kind of broached the topic with them. And I was like, you know, I mean, you're, I'm, we're working in commercials. We're doing a lot of things. They're very busy. They're Atlanta, a little Atlanta based um, commercial animation studio. And I said, you know what, do you got, you know, do you guys need people to write? And they said, yeah, we, we're, we're looking for writers, full-time writers. So I'm on the cusp of this 
so right now we're talking. It's not a done deal yet, but I may be writing full time professionally for the first time in my life, which is pretty cool. I'm nervous and excited, and I, you know, it's it's something that I think I think I'm going to relish. Like I think I'm going to relish the opportunity. But you know, I was thinking about this in terms of writing and talking to my fellow writers here, and just you know, there's a there's a million ways you guys could take this if you want to talk about your your process or what inspires you to write or maybe what initially turned you on to writing when you were a little younger, what your thoughts are doing it professionally, admires that, you know, writers that you admire or writers that you think or that you think are shit, whatever it is. But it's, it's, it's so funny the way it played out over the last couple of weeks, because this writing stuff just keeps coming up for me. Like I heard this, this quote, I think it was, I think this is Lynn manuel Miranda who created Hamilton, right? I heard a great quote from him. He said, somebody said that he says like the writer philosophy he lives by is to write like you're running out of time. Like don't stop writing, just keep writing, keep creating, which I thought was really simple, but super cool, right? And then that kind of played into getting this, maybe this career opportunity where I'm going to take a turn and for, you know, for the first time not being, you know, I'm not going to be an animator. Or character design, I'm not going to be concentrating on the visual art and be concentrating on a different creative side of things. So, Micah, in a lady's first capacity, writing, as I emailed, you could take this in a million different directions as I pass the baton to you. But uh, yeah, talk to me as a, as a writer, as a fellow writer. Well, yeah, what we're really doing is going losers first because I, <laughs> I'm a writer, you know, hobby only, really, because I genuinely love it. But it's never going to go anywhere type thing, but I do love it. And it did start when I was quite young and I always did love writing scary things, which mm. is, it's funny because I have a very low tolerance for most scary things, but I delighted in scaring other children. So I remember distinctly getting in trouble in fourth grade. I was nine and we had to write a poem about the importance of reading. Mm. And I made mine about how children who don't read get eaten by birds. And I got in trouble because it was too graphic. I drew pictures to go along with it. it you know, it probably would someday be put in like a news article about what I went crazy. But that was the kind of the start of, oh, I really like writing, but you got to tamp it down a bit. People don't like that in fourth grade anyways. <laughs> it wasn't until like high school that I would actually be able to write horror and be praised for it. Because I also remember like in middle school, for example, I, I would get good marks on essays. English was always one of my favorite classes. I was really torn as a kid because I loved science. I loved math. And I liked English a lot too. I really liked everything about school except gym class. That was, that was the one I struggled with. But I liked everything. I was definitely the kid who had no clue what they'd want to do when they grew up because everything seemed fun. But writing was always there. Uh, my mom let us play with this old typewriter that she had. And I was always typing up stories on it, once again, getting in trouble for writing stories that were scary. But once I got to high school and we actually just very similar to you, Dagan, we got to do a creative writing class and we had a short story segment and it was specifically horror. And I remember just actually really having so much fun with it. And it was one of like the best responses I got from my teacher at that time. And I just remember thinking like, this is just something I would love to do. But it's not something I could ever pursue because I wasn't allowed to go to college. And then when I later did go to college, I just went to community college just to get a job. <laughs> so it's not something I ever really pursued in a career aspect, which just seems so outlandish to me. But I do just love it. I do like to, I haven't had time recently because of uh, between the wedding and the Black Friday sales, but previously I did like wake up every day. I'd take like a half hour of just writing time. These aren't things I show people, but I just enjoy it. I, I just write my stupid little horror stories and they're, they're never going to go anywhere, <laughs> but I like it. It's just about the, I don't know, the enjoyment of it, I suppose. And I do. I mean, I have some favorite writers. My all-time favorite author is Amy Tan. Not horror, 
by any means. I just adore her and I think she's fantastic. I was delighted to find out though that she's friends with Stephen King, who's my favorite horror writer. Ah. So I thought that was a really cool connection of she's my all time favorite author and she's by chance like just even cooler because she's friends with Stephen King, which I love Stephen King books. I have not read all of them by any means, but I'm working my way through his catalog. There's something about books that I don't find scary. As much as I am a scaredy cat with horror games and movies, books aren't scary. I don't know what it is, but those I, they're suspenseful. They're tense. But something about horror novels... You just close your eyes when things get crazy, so... <laughs> <laughs> it really is like... um. I, I never thought I'd read Stephen King because even as a child, my dad had this gorgeous collection of Stephen King hardcover books. He only has a couple of them left because um, he ended up like tag sailing them. And I was like, no, I'd get rid of all oh. those books. So I have one that he sent me. But the, just the covers of those books used to terrify me as a kid. I would like sprint past his bookcase because they were so scary. And it took me years to finally say, I'll try and read one of these. And it wasn't that bad. And I just remember thinking, oh, this is a level of scary that I can engage with because everybody told me, oh, that book will scare you, you know, or my dad would even tell me that book gave me nightmares. But there's something about the written word that isn't scary to me. I don't know what it is because everything else terrifies me. Like That's just movie previews give me nightmares. But, <laughs> you know, it's like I, I loved like Pet Cemetery and uh, Salem's Lot, uh, The Shining so far, just like none of those have scared me. And which is great because I, I really like reading them. The Stand as well. It's just one of those mm. things that they are not scary to me the way that movies are. And it really, though, getting back into reading after taking it, some time off from it, from being busy, suddenly I just had all my own ideas. And that really is where just all the inspiration comes from is that the more that I read, the more that I just have all my own ideas. My My mind just works differently when I'm in that mode of, I look at something and say, that's a story. And so reading for me is essential to writing. And I, I distinctly notice that if I don't read very much, I don't write very much. Like mm. those two things go hand in hand. I have a whole like notes app in my phone, just full of story ideas that I am working on. But those completely stop if I stop reading. So that, that inspiration is definitely important, you know, to being there. And without it, it just is like the ideas. The ideas are all my own, but I don't, my brain doesn't work the same way without taking in somebody else's art, essentially. I don't know how to explain it in any more eloquent way that Colin probably could. It makes sense. Like iron sharpens iron when you're, if you're, it, it may, it, it's like me paying attention to art, not just animation art, but any sort of visual art. You know, you're incorporating those ideas or techniques or just the way the artist is doing a certain thing, drawing eyes or something, you know, it's like, I want to fold a little bit of that. Yes. Into my own work. So it keeps you, it's interesting that you find books the least scary because I find them the most scary because it leaves <laughs> the most up to your imagination. Remember, I never read much Stephen King, but I remember delving into that when I was a kid. Did, what was the what was his werewolf book? Uh, Silver Bullet? Is that what it's Oh, called? I have not read that one. I don't, don't quote me on the title, but I remember picking up from a shelf. I was like an adolescent, maybe 11 years old in the library and just opening up to a random passage and being like, oh, fuck this. It was like, <laughs> you know, the werewolf was like, disemboweling somebody and it was you know described in gory detail and i was like this is too much it's too much for me you know what i mean like it just plants too many seeds i'm way too neurotic i mean salad finger scared the shit out of me last night you know i'm, I'm <laughs> seeing that guy in the dark it's like i'm 50 years old why have i you know like it's not it's not good for me but i horror something about writing horror though it's like exercising those demons so what you're yeah. saying yeah it can be and, and sure. you've You've given me the means to say it in a way that makes sense. When I read a lot, it turns on my inner narrator. When I'm really busy and my mind is going like, you know, just 100 miles an hour because like I have just too much to do, my brain kind of just goes on autopilot. When I have that moment, though, of like creativity, it's almost like I'm narrating everything I'm doing. She opened the fridge. She got out the butter. Like my mind slows down in a way that everything I'm doing becomes narrated, like which Wake. maybe is crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alan Wake does that and all the time. So, well, and so that's what works for me in terms of 
me finding stories in little things. Um, I'm always the person who finds like the faces in things. Uh, there's a word for that, but the person who finds faces in like wood paneling or like patterns. Sure. And it's just, but in my head, like that's where my mind's always going, but only when I'm in the right zone. If I'm anxious, if I'm really busy, my brain doesn't do that at all. And the times that I tend to not read are when I'm anxious and when I'm really busy. But reading, it does, it turns on that inner narrator that literally everything could be a story. And that's when those sparks come from of like, then I write it down, like that's actually an idea. You know, like it starts with me just in my head saying she took the blender out of the cabinet. It ends with whatever hand got stuck in the blender. Those are more intrusive thoughts, but it, it, the whole thing ties in together of like why I like writing horror. <laughs> I, I don't know, Micah. There's something super cool about you writing just for your, like the purity of you writing just for yourself, like kind of writing in a vacuum. You, you never share it or expect it to go anywhere and you still do it out of the love of it for it. But at the same time, I feel like that's kind of tragic. Like you should share it, maybe take it a step further, you know? And it, sometimes it's, Colin and I talk about this a lot. There's this kind of, and I think about this with my career too. It's like a one for you, one for me mentality. It's like Colin doesn't want to do sports podcasting, even though he's a bit of an expert, especially in football, because that's for him. You know what I mean? Where video games, he's got a, it's something he enjoys, but it's his career, you know, it's his job to talk about those things. You know, with you, I don't want to rob you of the purity of writing, but maybe sharing it, you know, then writing exists on a whole nother level for you. And who knows, maybe you're even good enough to do it professionally. I mean, Especially with the be... advent of self-publishing and just having a built-in audience by being, you know, a YouTuber and, you know, you're getting more and more popular by the day, you know, who knows? <laughs> that would be like a dream come true. I think part of it is, and this is just our upbringing, having I'm, and I don't mean this as a knock to my parents. Like, I love my parents. They had very low expectations of us in a way that they didn't put a lot of pressure on us. There was no expectation of us to do anything great. It was, I'm going to go be a machinist. My sister will probably be a receptionist. We're going to get married. And that's kind of the goal, right? Mm. That's what the focus was on. The focus was never to have a career. It's something I would absolutely love to do. I don't. I think I'm probably just terrified to ever let anybody read my writing. And part of that too is just even as an adult, my parents have like zero expectations of what I could do with my life in a way that's a blessing because they didn't put a ton of pressure on me. On the other side of it, when I share like a goal or something with them, they don't take it seriously because I wanted to... Uh, I want to take a creative writing class at like the local college here because you can just take you can take a few classes without like a major, you know, just kind of take them a la carte. I wanted to do that. And I told my dad about it and he kind of like laughed at it and he didn't mean to be mean about it. But he just, you know, to him, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, sure, you'll be a writer someday, you know, and I'll fucking fly. It was just one of those things of like, yeah, well, I meant it. And then I kind of was like, well, never mind. Uh, and maybe it's one of those things I'll maybe work up to again at some point, but the confidence is definitely not there and the self doubt is overwhelming, but mm. it is, I mean, that would be, that'd be like the ultimate dream to have like my own collection of short stories, my own night shift. I mean, that'd be incredible. I, but it is, I've like, for now it's the safe comfort of, I just, I just enjoy writing and it is just for me. And there's no, there's no expectation there and there's no disappointment either, I guess, but it is That's something I would, way. I'd love to do. I yeah. mean, that'd be like, that'd be the great, and then maybe I'd get to meet Amy Tan and then it would all come full circle there you go. and then we'd be friends. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. Gene, what do you think, my friend? We're going to the pro writer here. Um, yeah, just all things writing, however you want to pull it. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, there's there's a million ways I could tackle this. Um, I think we uh, recently on Constellation, we talked about our names, right? Uh, so I talked about how I was actually named after a writer, uh, playwright Eugene O'Neill, uh, who wrote, who famously wrote uh, The Iceman Cometh. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always been kind of like in my uh, quote unquote gene, I guess, uh, to, to, to become a writer. Um, I love my name because because I because uh, because I love having DNA DNA related puns. Uh, there's actually a, there's actually a gene park in Wales where they actually deal in genetics, and they're just called the Wales Gene Park. Um, <laughs> and we follow each other on Twitter. Oh, it's, nice! It's always been fun. That's awesome. Um, 
So I, how did I get into writing? Uh, I always read books. Uh, I spent so much time. It was really comic books that, that, that turned me on to, to reading, first of all. Uh, uh, manga too, but uh, uh, mostly comic books, superhero comic books, Superman, Spider-Man, all that stuff. Uh, and then uh, what did I first start reading? Of course, I, I read like Goosebumps, uh, you know, Encyclopedia Brown, if you guys remember. Yeah, uh, of, course. Uh, of course. Oh, my God. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of those detective novels and stuff like that, mystery so novels, uh, you know, uh, training wheels, right? As you graduate to the bigger stuff. I don't remember what I, I – I guess I read a lot of classic literature too. Um, I was a huge fan of that, uh, a, lot, a huge fan of 20th century literature too. Um, and it wasn't until I really started to read um, existential uh, uh, writings, uh, mostly by Franz Kafka. Uh, Franz Kafka is probably my most uh, influential uh, writer, at least in terms of uh, how I approach writing, how I approach thinking about life, uh, which is very dark and very dire. <laughs> uh, uh, because, you know, uh, of course, Kafka is the, the, the author of The Metamorphosis about mm-hmm. the guy who wakes up and finds himself uh, as a cockroach. And he has to deal with that. Or uh, must read a must read. By yeah, the way. yeah. Or 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 my favorite book by him called The Trial, um, which is about a gentleman named Joseph K, who is on trial for crimes he doesn't. He, he's never informed of what he committed. You know, um, which is which I believe I feel like Colin uh, can can relate to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like yeah, very, very <laughs> in some way. What did I do? Like, what did I do? But yeah. I'm on trial every day for this. You yeah. Know? Um, <laughs> totally. obviously at a much smaller scale or who knows maybe it was a bigger scale I don't know the, no. the, 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 with, with, the, with, with the size of media these days you know maybe Joseph K was just in, in his own little world or whatever uh, but uh, Kafka was a, a huge uh, uh, influence of mine and actually I only read Franz Kafka and Colin and Dagan you both like this because his name sounded like Kefka yeah oh, I, that's amazing that's, that's um, literally it bro that's literally it that's I've the only that reason why too. i was like oh this author looks interesting because he's his fucking name sounds fucking red right yeah and i picked totally. him up and then i was like oh wait this is like blowing my mind and changing the entire uh, uh process progress of my life uh which is why i i, I always you know uh genuflect to final fantasy 6 as one of the most influential texts of my life because so much so much of what i discovered comes from final fantasy 6 you know um, that's awesome but uh, yeah, and then you know, I, I got, uh, and you can go back to the old, old uh, Sacred Symbols Plus episode where Colin and I first spoke, where I, you know, I, I talked about you know getting an internship at the at school paper, and that was because uh, I was uh, really into creative writing as as a young teen. Uh, I wrote a lot of short stories. Um, okay, and now I now I know where I can go. With this I wrote a lot of short stories when I was in like eighth grade, seventh grade, uh, freshman year in college or in, in high school. And I was always sent to the school psychologist because of my writing, because my writing was very dark and my heroes would always end up in tragedy. So it got to the point where my schools, two schools, both schools were very, very concerned about my mental state. And they were wondering if I was you know, doing drugs or whether I was being beaten at home. Uh, you know, they even called my parents and let them know, you know, that they, they, they found my writings very disturbing. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, great, this is awesome. I, lo- I love all the attention I'm getting, you know, uh, uh, for, for my writing. Um, what did I used to write? I used to write about, I used to write about various archetypes. I think Colin was talking about how there's only certain ways that you can, uh, you know, tell certain stories. Uh, for me, I was always about fighting some monstrous version of myself. So some, you know, like if, if you know Scott Pilgrim, the nega Scott version of, 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 yeah. of Gene, right? The nega Gene or the mon- monster Gene or dark shadow Gene. gene. Shadow Gene. Exactly. <laughs> Which is why like, she, you know, Shadow Lincoln, Zelda. Yes. And exactly. all this stuff. And, or even Alan Wake. Alan Wake versus Mr. Scratch, stuff mm-hmm. like that too. It's all archetypes. Um, and that's what we can go into. I'll go into that more in my Alan Wake 2 spoiler and my review that I, that I just finished writing. That I had writer's block about, you know. Um. But, uh, yeah, so I got into journalism because of that, because I thought, you know, oh, this is an easy way for me to become a published writer uh, is to do journalism. And then I found journalism, for journalism was very different from creative writing, um, which is why I never and I, I still don't to this day. I'm not into the idea of being an investigative journalist. 
or or being a heartbreaking news journalist. You know, like people always point to me and Jason Schreier as uh, the, the the two uh, most mainstream writers uh, in games. And Jason obviously does a lot more hard news, and that's great. I th- I think that's wonderful. He he does it so good because I can never do that because I'm not one one I've never been trained in it, but two partially because I never wanted to be trained in it. I, it's never been an interest. I never wanted to do, to do that. I tried investigative reporting, um, and I was always discouraged, but mostly because uh, my, my old paper were, were cowards, uh, and, and uh, you know they, they were well, we, we got threatened by a lawsuit. Maybe we shouldn't do anything. I'm just like. Well, whatever, you know, this is stupid. Anyways, I, I really wanted to be a culture critic. I want to be a culture writer. I want to be a features writer, um, which is why, you know, my position right now as a Washington Post style right, reporter is great. This is actually what I've always wanted to be in my entire life. And so I, I just kind of accidentally stumbled, uh, stumbled upon it. Um, but then I, I, I obviously, I, since I did journalism, I stopped doing creative writing, you know, uh, but I always try to do. Writing on the side, uh, I wrote for a small website called GameCritics.com, and that was where I started to develop my my chops for for writing in in cultural pieces. And uh, but then I always covered you know uh, crime and and stuff like that. And we'll talk more about crime later uh, in, in my own topic. Uh, but um, where where else to go with this? I, 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 Dagan, what, what what do you want to know about about? You know, I would love to pick your brain about one thing sure, Gene, sure, sure. that occurred to me. As somebody who I could talk all day about writing, like for a thousand hours. So, you know, <laughs> like, like, please give me That's some direction. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it could be a whole podcast on its own. It was a whole podcast on its own with with Colin. So, yeah, you know. yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. No, you could definitely be helpful with this because I remember, you know, I cut my teeth writing creatively. You know, mostly short stories, mm-hmm. mostly poetry. If I wrote an article for the Odd Skateboarding Magazine, it was very. I, I had a lot of autonomy to just be creative with it. There was no general general structure mm. when i wrote when i got tapped to write for my first video game book for pat country's nes book so it was basically reviewing and reflecting on specific nintendo games and we were going to do collectively we we're going to tackle the whole catalog i struggled with getting into non-fiction review writing so badly that i remember going to the editor and being like, look, let me just write the reflections mm. where I could just be, you know, I could just be creative and very conceptual and I'll play all the games, but let somebody else write the reviews because I don't know. I just, I, I struggled with it for weeks until I got into, I learned how to do it. I learned how to take my writing chops and I guess my creative writing abilities and sort of format it for a nonfiction template, let's say. And so I got there eventually, but I was wondering, how did you parlay your creative writing abilities and growing up writing and being into, you know, reading fiction and all that into being a journalist? Because a journalist, I'm not like, Mm -hmm. I I would never consider myself a journalist in any way. Like I'm just, I don't have that skill set. So how did you take that? How did you take writing and and turn it into a specific type of writing that you do professionally? And, And do you struggle with that? Yeah, yeah. Well, journalism is uh, like straight straight news journalism is uh, obviously a little different because you know it's all about information gathering, and going to like, for example, the scene of the crime or whatever. But I'm always writing in my head when I'm at a murder scene. I'm already thinking about what the first paragraph and the last paragraph will be. Mm. You know, when I'm driving away from the murder scene, I'm already formulating the story in my head. I, I was like, how am I going to build this? And then when I sit down, I just dump that all into in, uh, onto the word doc right i love that uh, uh and i try to, to try to try to frame it as a narrative you know for example when i covered the story about um a boy who witnessed his mother getting beaten in the street by his father with a shotgun you know and he hit her so hard the shotguns lodged into her face Oof. and her son and their son watched him do that of course, he got arrested, right? And I spoke to the kid the next day, man, you know, the next morning after, after witnessing such a traumatic event. Man. And the only thing he had to say was, I hate him. I hate my father. And I was like, what a powerful quote. That's, that's exactly what the, how I'm going to st- start the story, you know? And it's crazy to be in this, like, terrible, awful situation. And I'm still th- thinking about, okay, how am I going to write this story or whatever, like, how am I going to structure this story? But that's the kind of pressure that I've been in where, uh, where it's like, okay, I, I need to do this and I need to present this in a way that's powerful, that's memorable. Um, and that will tell the story accurately. So that's always been tough. 
at least in terms of like my critical writing and my culture writing, uh, that comes from like years and years of exactly what Colin just said earlier in a, in a podcast. Uh, if you want to be a good writer, you got to read. You got to read a mm. lot. That's the only only way you can be a good writer. That you you gotta you gotta read. So for me, I was always uh, I was I've been a huge fan of Rolling Stone magazine uh, for my entire life, and so much of my writing uh, stems from um, you know reading that. You know, I, I read a lot of video game magazines, but I never read those with the intention of learning from how to write from them. You know, a lot of my sense of humor and maybe even the way I think about games comes from that, right? But I was always very, very careful about making sure that my writing isn't influenced by them, which is why I don't use words like fun and, and everything in my video game reviews, mm-hmm. right? Because um, I, I, I always wanted to make sure that that was never trained into my way of thinking. Uh, I always focused on music reviews, movie film reviews. Roger Ebert is obviously a, a huge uh, uh, inspiration of mine. The, the biggest inspiration, Roger Ebert, period. Wow. Um, when, he di- when he died, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, really, it really hit, hit me. Um, and, I, and I still, when I had writer's block, I would go back and read a review of, of his and, and try to get, get, that, get, get those gears working again. You know, um, I would read... Uh, sports articles. Uh, for me, sports writers are the best writers in news because you have to write about ever about the same thing every time. So the the uh, you know that they are the best writers because they have to find different ways of saying of, of saying the same thing in different ways great almost point. every day. It's a great so, point. So 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 they they have to be very very talented. They have to be very very diverse in in the, the way they describe things. And I love that. Um, I would read a lot of car reviews, automo- automobile reviews. You know, a lot of video games are, are very tech based too. Um, they're very consumer facing. So I always try to th- think about what, what, you know, how would you describe a car? How would you describe the feeling of a car? You know, uh, and that's how I go for when, when I try to describe like what, how a game feels. You know, that's always that, 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 that's, that's such a unique thing that I think it's hard to describe and that you can't really read or take from a music review or a film review. So that's why I go to car reviews, you know. Um that's awesome. That's a great tip. Yeah, yeah. And Trick. yeah, so it's just it's just reading a a, a variety of things, you know. Cuz then you, I, when I read games writing, um I can tell that everyone reads each other, you know. Uh because, because they're all using the same words. Cuz they all say the and, same thing. And, huh? Cuz they all say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, cuz they all say the same thing. because because they all say the same same thing and using the same words, you know. You read one review and you know, you we run ten out of ten review, and it sounds very similar to another ten out of ten review. You know? Yeah, that sucks. And it's like I don't want to be in that space. I'm not, I'm not reading other game critics. You know, I yeah, never, no, totally, I dude, totally. I almost I never read other game reviews. You it's know? so funny you say that because I was the same way. It's not a holier than thou thing. It's like I don't read any of you. I have no idea what any of you say about anything because yeah. yeah. I, I'm kind of your, your competitor in some sense, mm-hmm. and I need to come in kind of fresh in some way. So I just read other things instead. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's exactly the opposite of the the, the Philip Mewson approach, where he was like, like trying to like absorb. <laughs> for obviously, for those who don't know, Philip Mewson is the the gentleman who got fired from IGN for plagiarizing like a thousand fucking game reviews. Yeah, like reviews, and that was the thing when I grilled him on my podcast, and I was thankful he came on the podcast. I'm not trying to yeah, disrespect him that, in that yeah. way, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah, just yeah. like, shout you, out to Philip. You, you Philip plagiarize. Yeah, shout out to Philip Mewson. You <laughs> you plagiarize what is the easiest form of writing. Mm-hmm, like sure. the, and and the hey. most personal form of writing, like usually plagiarists plagiarize deep, you know, researched things mm-hmm. that they're stealing. And usually, right. as I said on the show, it's done by accident. Mm-hmm. Like it's usually like a grad in academia. It's usually like a grad student researcher didn't mm-hmm. cite something properly and and like fucks the entire book up. Basically, that's mm-hmm. the right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that was that was so weird. Here's what I was. Uh, Gene, may I? Or are you? Oh yeah, yeah, but but I I remember the, the I remember that that Philip interview because you you brought that point up. It's like you are you are plagiarizing what could be what is the easiest. I, I don't want to say easiest because you know game reviewing can, can be hard, but like it is coming from the only place where it could come from, which is your experience. Like, like yeah. how hard is it to your how hard voice, is it really to just dude. write down your experience and how you feel about a game? It's right? so That's easy. So yeah, you're strange. plagiarizing someone else's opinion, opinion. Exactly. on a game. Opinion. Like this yeah. is an opinion. Yeah. It's not creative writing. It's not technical writing where you have to like, oh, you know, write down this whole process from like A to B and make it succinct and concise. Cause it's like mm. another type of writing I really loved was documentation, like software documentation. Yeah. 
uh, oh. but it's like you're plagiarizing someone's opinion. It's yeah, like, yeah, don't yeah. You have so, one? So, yeah, yeah. So, so it was so striking to hear how he kept talking about imposter syndrome and how he felt like he wasn't ready. You, you know, I want to be a little, a little gentle on Phil, but it's like I get, I get that, you know. But I also don't get that because it also spoke to me how some people are ju- are, are just not cut out for this. You right. Know? That's exactly he was right. never that's fucking exactly right. cut out for this right. at that's, all. That's why I told 100%. him like on the show. Like, yeah, you know, I was like, you don't belong here. You, you, yeah, you, were, like, you were never ready. You were yeah. never qualified in the first place. No way. So you, you were the imposter syndrome at at least in this in this aspect was properly placed. You know? Right. Right. That, yeah. that, 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 that you knew you were an imposter and and you you were wearing the skin suit of of, of a of a reviewer. Yeah, a real critic. Because I know? I'm I don't know. There there is so much to say about this. I yeah, fancy myself. Ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, it's all good. I I no, there's nothing to be sorry about at all. I I. I am a writer, but I think it's something that I came to. And I've, I've said this about myself. Like one of my great flaws as a person, I think, is that if something doesn't come naturally to me, I'm not interested in it. It, mm. it almost is never a thing where I'm like, I want to learn. It's something has to come naturally to me. So when I'm interested in something with history, I've been watching a lot of like Mesoamerican history videos on YouTube and they're really interesting. You know, the Olmec and the Aztec and the Mayans and it's good yeah, shit. Sure. Yeah. But like, I'm like, this isn't, I'm like, to me, I'm like, I just don't know this, but I just have to watch this and then I'll know all of it. And I know how to absorb it and all of that. And I think as a kid growing up, once you get out of the, the, you know, the fucking times tables and all that easy shit, when you get start getting to algebra and more sophisticated sciences, like biology and everything, what I realized about myself was I'm like, you're really not good at that at all. And in my, in my mind, Mm -hmm. I was, I just shut it off. I was like, I'm not good at that. I'm literally just trying to survive. And that's why I had the really unusual high school track at, at Bellport where Dagan and I went, where it was a big high school and there were different classes. So earth science, for instance, in New York, in New York state is a ninth grade science, but you could yeah. take it in eighth grade. And so if you took it in ninth grade, you were on the level, but you would be taking it, um, you know, with just like the kind of more the, the bottom 50 percent, let's say, or bottom 60 percent of the people in your class. And then biology would be next. But when you took biology in 10th grade, there would be ninth graders and they would be the advanced ninth graders and you would be kind of. And so I was in that track on science and math where I was just on the level where I was supposed right. to be. But I had the weird experience of being in AP and honors track on the other side. It made no sense. No, there was almost no one like me because those kids were all together in all the honors and AP classes. And I kind of just joined them for half of them. And then I kind of bounced out. And that was not their experience. Because I took to English and history, so I took AP Euro and AP American and AP Literature, you know, um, and all of the rest, English Literature, and that stuff just came very naturally to me. So I think what I realized as a kid, and then when I started writing at GameFAQs when I was 14, is uh, I was actually, it's funny you bring up technical writing, that was my first real talent was technical writing. I'm, a, I'm an excellent technical writer, and as my, uh, no, not for nothing, I am, and it's <laughs> as like a strategy guide writer. And as Micah knows, my tolerance, and I've said it on Sacred many times, my tolerance for bad strategy guides is less than zero because <laughs> I've written so many of them between, I wrote 38, I think, at GameFAQs and 94 at IGN. So I've written a lot of them. And that's kind of where I got my, made my bones as a professional writer, I guess. But it was funny. I, I came to a time in 2010 where I, I literally went to Hillary Goldstein, who was the EIC at the time. And I told him, I was like, I can't fucking do this anymore. So either like I can't do this anymore. I'm totally broken. I just went through something where I was like, I, I don't want to, I can't write like this anymore. It's driving me insane. And that's when I became the PlayStation editor at IGN. Was it the minu- the minutia call and just how tedious it yeah, was? Yeah, it was, it was becoming, it is, there's something I've, I've said this before that my, the OCD in me, I've leaned into in a lot of different ways to great effect. And I think being a technical writer and a strategy guide writer was one of those things where I enjoyed making the pie fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller and adding to the index of more and more walkthroughs and more and more side quests and all that. And it just really spoke to me, but it was the, the game, the obsidian game fallout new Vegas that broke me. And I, I was like, I, this is going to be my last strategy guide. And it was, I'm like, I can't, <laughs> do this anymore. In fact, there was a, there's a, it's not famous, but it was well-known at the time exchange between me and uh, Pete Hines at who's the marketing guy at Bethesda. When I did the fallout three guide, they had tweeted something like our fallout three guide is an extraordinary, whatever, hundred, few hundred thousand words. And I'm like, our fallout three guide that I wrote by myself on IGN is 600,000 words. Wow. So yeah. And that, that literally the fallout three guide was so important. IGN and did so much traffic. I worked on it for three months. 
Like I that was it. all yeah. I did. I use it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Great. Oh, wow. That's like all I did was yeah. just the Fallout 3 guy. That was like my entire job because it was so important. But I knew I had to get away from that. And what I wanted to say about my own writing is I think there are some things I'm just not even interested in. Like, I don't like writing dialogue. I wrote the dialogue in Twin Breaker, and I don't think there's dialogue in almost anything else that I wrote. Maybe there's some dialogue in like Super Perils of Baking. What I think I'm talented in personally uh, is I'm a creative person. And I know that that sounds like everyone feels like they're creative, but everyone, what I've learned too is everyone also thinks they can write. And as I make fun of the audience on Sacred Symbols all the time, it's like, oh boy. You know, when I read some of these things that people write in or the way people talk on the internet, it's like, holy shit, half of the people out there are just completely illiterate. And I, I think I took for granted that people knew how to communicate in a written way better than they they do. So I think I kind of understood as I've gotten older, it's like, no, that is a real town. So I've written four indie games now. It took me a day to write each of those games, except for Super Perils of Baking. It took me like a few days. And I'm the type of writer, as I said before, it's the old joke, like I'm, I don't write. It's like, oh, what you, you when do you, when, you know, you're a writer. When do you write? Oh, I don't write. You know, it's, it's that kind of, I just think about things and get things going creatively and then I get them all out. And with the role playing game, which we'll reveal next year and hopefully even maybe even release next year, I don't know, is that was all my idea. And I structured it all and made the characters and made the lore and what's going on or whatever. But the minutia, I'm almost not even interested in writing it. Like how it's for Jono, who's writing the game itself. It's like you get us from point A to point B. You know that these are all the things that he need to happen. This is where it all takes place because I love lore and I love mm-hmm. just saying, here's what happened. And then this happened and then this happened and this happened to this person. And so that's like the shit I love. And that's where I think I'm best. And so, and then somebody connects the dots, like right? In exactly. Your animation. Right? And, and so you were like I, George R. R. Martin with Elden Ring, where you just like, <laughs> like this is like, right? This exactly. Is like someone. Right? That, oh, is that people, what he did? Because okay. people, that's, yeah, that's what he did for Elden Ring. He was like, this is the lore, this is the background and history, right, right. and you guys figure out the rest of the story. Yeah, okay. and, and um, okay. uh, Milius, John Milius did that for Homefront, and, mm-hmm. and same same sort of thing. Who, of course, that's wrote awesome. Red Dawn, one of the greats, and so. Mm-hmm. And Apocalypse Now and whatever. So it's funny. I have a talent, I think, in games writing in the sense that I because we're making old school games and I know and we talk about them a lot that a lot of the great old school NES, SNES games aren't necessarily mega verbose. Some of them even go too fast. That's one of the problems with Final Fantasy IV, for instance, where it's like, man, slow down. You don't need to go so fast. But I like just adding accoutrements to old games to make them buzz a little bit better with just a little buzz of creativity. So one thing I did with Hybroxia 1 on PS5, which we've we've patched on the other versions of the game too, is it was very old school, almost arcadey. You would come to it, it would just be the logo, and then you would go to this, the, you'd hit a button, you'd go to the next screen, it would be like stage one, stage two, you'd just go through all these. And I'm like, let's, dude, we can simplify this. Let's make a map of the solar system. you know. And that's what we did. And then I'm like, I'll write just a little sentence for each place we go to just give it something give you like a kinetic direction through the game and in the herboxia sense you're starting an earth and moving your way out through the system and so we wrote that about why the aliens are in certain places and just give you things to think about as you play through the game but not give you too much and that's kind of the stuff and then an intro and and an ending and sometimes we like in super perils of baking there's a there's a secret ending and all the rest and i like doing that stuff but I do think that with my writing these days, more is kind of less um, or less is more rather. And, and, and it's like uh, with this less is more mentality, I think it fits well into the fact that I don't have any time to really write anymore. I feel creatively totally stretched thin because it's weird. Like I have to write sometimes four or five or six ads a week, let's say. And it sounds fun. It sounds strange. But if you want your ads to be good and our ads are good, they're usually funny and, and you know, whatever it is I have to sit there and write them. And I write them every week and you think about that and it's like, okay, that's like a little bit of my creative energy gone. And then I have to correspond with all these different emails and I have to do this and I have to write the descriptions for the shows and I have to do it's a lot of it. And then before you know it, it's like, I don't know, I don't have anything left in me anymore. And that's kind of the position I'm in now, which is with the role playing game, which I always envisioned. I thought about the idea for this game for years is I had to let it go or it was never going to happen. Like where it's like, mm-hmm. I don't have time to do this. And so that's kind of my lamentation with writing as well. But I, um, yeah, I I came up, I mean, I was a professional writer and it was a, it was an amazing experience, but I don't necessarily consider myself that anymore. I, I write games now, I guess. And it's, these are really just basic stories. You write the show too. You know, that's I, do. I write you sacred symbols every week, which you, you, is you write sacred symbols and yeah. you do a good job of it. I think that's I, at first I thought you were just like reading an, an article verbatim. 
And then I was, and then I realized, oh, he's just reading his notes that he he wrote because I'm I'm recognizing your voice now in 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 what you write now. You know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I try to. I like putting like background information and context mm-hmm. in, and a lot of it is very selfish in the sense that I love regurgitating things over and over again so that I just know them masterfully. Mm-hmm. Oh, you do that? Okay. Yeah. Like I'll. That's part of the reason the is when something like with Naughty Dog happens, I'll often pull like Naughty Dog release this and this year and this and this year and whatever. It's like not really important. And some people will find it interesting. But for me, it's like I just know that stuff so intuitively now that I just don't when you don't have to go to a Wikipedia page or anything anymore to be like, when did this game come out? When did this game come out? When did Sony buy the studio? When did this happen? When did this Mm -hmm. happen or whatever? And what did this do? A lot of that is reinforcing in just the writing itself. So it's not only for the audience, it's also for my own knowledge. Because Yeah, I, I saw someone on, on on our Reddit say, why does Colin always say the year of the game before saying the title of the game? And I was like, that's just how we talk as journalists. Uh, if, I, if I was going to say The Last of Us, I would say 2013 is The Last of Us. It gives right. you context. Exactly. It gives you the, the context about how much time there was. It's been 10 years since The Last of Us. That's right. in, isn't it interesting? Yeah, I that's agree. Information yeah, you, that's interesting information you glean from just saying that, you know? I concur. So Kyle, I have a statement and a question for you. All right. First of all, I want to say like, it's, it's so interesting. I keep coming back to this and we often do on the podcast, but the fact that we both came through the same high school English teacher. So reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had her, I had her three years, a decade apart. Yeah. 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 And you know, I do wonder, and you're kind of a reflection of this a little less so for me, but I do wonder, like if I go back to Mrs. Parry sort of discovering me and taking me under her wing. Like I remember like she would come on the weekends, pick me up and we would go to like, she would take me to poetry readings and different literature events. Like she really took an interest in me as a writer, you know? And I think, I I guess I think about Helene now being a high school teacher, like there's something, there's a great responsibility in taking somebody, right? Who you know has a lifelong aspiration to do a thing, right? For me, it was animation. And to come to me in my sophomore year in high school and say, you know what? You should rethink this. That's, he- that's a heavy thing to do. So she, she definitely saw something. And I often wonder, like, what was it? It couldn't be that first crappy short story that sounded like, you know, low rent Edgar Allan Poe, right? Had to be something more than that. Like, what did she, what was she reading into? And I do think a lot of it was similar to you that, I was slumming it in every other department, like social studies, math, science. I was standard or maybe even below average. The only time I was with those top 10 or top 20 kids in my class was in college prep and honors English for the last three years of high school. Mm. And that was the only time I was ever in their orbit. Like I remember my friend, Eric, who was one of those guys graduating in the top 10 of our class, listens to the podcast. So I know he's listening right now. Other people that I went to school with that were always the smartest kids, Sandy and Heather. That was the only time I was ever in that floating around in their orbit was in English. And maybe that was the thing that Mrs. Parry saw. It was like, this is the only, there's something like he rises, he's the cream rising to the top in English, but none none of the the other things. Like it makes it, it makes that person stand out. Like Colin was also very good in history slash social studies. I didn't even have that. So I was like, who is this interesting guy who just knows how to write and is obviously literate, but sucks at everything else? You know, there had to be a little bit of that. But what I wanted to ask you, Kyle, was from, I mean, first of all, I not to make your head any more swollen, but there is something that you have as a, like you have a latent talent for writing that reminds me of Helene with art. I know thousands of artists. I've been doing it for 25 years professionally. Helene is one of the only people I know that could put down the pencil or the paintbrush for a year at a time, pick it back up again, and she leaves off right where she left, right, right where she left it. There's no rust. There's no shaking off the cobwebs. She just has that ability. Every time you and I have had the occasion to share writing for a different podcast and stuff, you always blow my mind because I know that you're not doing it you know, professionally daily necessarily anymore. But what I wanted to say about writing, you writing the ads for the companies, do you ever get kudos from these places? Because I know you're writing these ads better than most people on YouTube. I mean, you're in the top 1%. Let's face it. When, you, when it comes to the quality of creating these ads in terms of, in terms of craftsmanship and creativity, I'm sure, right? Do you ever get 
you know, a, a shot in the arm and say like, hey, you know, an attaboy from these places or they, do they not even realize it? Well, the we have an agency that interacts with like all the direct companies or whatever, but I have gotten feedback multiple times. I think I, I don't know exactly how I would put it because it wasn't, a, I don't know, I, didn't, I never learned anything. I think I won some sort of award for one of my ads through mm. some... That's huge. Like, I don't know what, because my ads, the ads now are a little more tame. They were used to be way crazier back when I first started <laughs> yeah. doing them, like way, way substantially crazier than they are now. And I think I had a kind Didn't of, they like that though? They did, but it was, it was, I don't know. I, I felt like it was, I, I wanted to tamp it down a little bit and make it a little more normal so that like maybe people would, I didn't want to like turn advertisers off or be like, this is not really what we're going for. We, we don't okay. get this anywhere else, but, but everything's always, there's always like zany and weird shit in the ads like every one of the ads has something weird or funny in it no doubt about it but it's they're not as crazy as they were but your stamp in other words right exactly my mushroom stamp as it were oh. and uh but i will say that the studio 71 which is the company we work with that i've worked with since 2018 on for for advertising they're awesome and they sell our ads and then they take a cut or whatever and they they compliment me pretty often like one of the great compliments for for me from them because they they listen to all the ads they'll send you maybe i'll share this stuff one day i don't even know what i can show people and what i couldn't i'd have to look into it but we just get copy ad copy in and it'll be like this is let me see if i can if i can even find one and i'll read it to you guys like yeah here here's one so yeah free sponsorship right here on constellation right so like um me undies Mm. Okay, so you have this thing from, and it says like advertiser, me undies, title, intro, and then copy points, and it says style. Like there's like a whole thing where it's like things you could talk about, like style for everyone, versatile loungewear, all these little sub subtext, and then you you basically, and there's a call to action usually that's verbatim, which is why it's always the same in the beginning, and you have to say in the beginning that the show is sponsored by something, so you always put that in the in the you know at the end and then in the beginning, so. They, they basically just give you this copy and give you guidelines and the guidelines are always a little, a little different company by company. So you work within the realm of, um, of what you can do. Like, uh, the, the, there's a company I'm working with now where like, there's just very specific things they do not want you to say. And oh. it's not about the product. It's about other products. Like they don't want you to bring certain things up. So it'll be like very urgent. Be like, don't say okay. this, don't say this. Oh, or kind of, kind of like how Silent Hill Ascension doesn't, didn't want people to say Hideo Kojima, come in my tummy. Right. Exactly. Come in my tummy, <laughs> but they got that nonetheless. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the, ad, so I get a lot of the compliment from studio 71. We have like a liaison there that we deal with is she almost never, ever asks us for edits. And that is a compliment because usually there's something wrong. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. You, and, she, and she writes usually every week and the response is yet again, great week, Colin, you know, or whatever, or no edits this week. Here is the pre-roll or it's usually that. And some, and if there's a problem, she's like, ah, I just cut this thing out. It's usually mm -hmm. not even a pickup or anything like that mm -hmm. because she's like, ah, that's inappropriate or like that doesn't really, <laughs> whatever, you know, um, or they didn't want you to use this word and you use this word. It's, it's usually that serious. They have someone just totally laser focused on that to make sure the copy's right. But I have to write all that copy and I kind of, Wednesday is the day I write. Wednesday is my writing day every week because I have to write, I write all the ads on Wednesday. I write the show on Wednesday and I usually write all of my uh, correspondence and shit on Thursday. Oh, wow. Like what, what I treat my correspondence like I'm like I'm Benjamin Franklin sitting at my desk where I'm like all these things stack up for a few days and then I'm like, all right, I got to shoot all these messages out and I do it all in 10 minutes. So. Yeah, like I'll suddenly be like, here are three sacred plus episodes to schedule. And I'm like, where did all these come from? And then I'll look at the dates. I'm like, this is from three days ago. Yeah. But like, it's just that's just Colin's process. Yeah, I just so, yeah, writing is uh, it's a feed your ego that, 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 that you know, that you get that feedback from ad and ad copy. And you're like, I could be an ad copywriter if, if yeah, his ego needs more. Oh, I mean, down. I was like, I could, I could, ad ad Don Draper. Do I could ease. I, first of all, I would love to transform into Don Draper. Second of all, um, yeah, the guy selling hams. Selling, it's not. She keeps selling. Yeah, stop. It's John Ham. But. <laughs> But yeah, I think about that too. I think I actually would be very natural because actually in watching Mad Men with the Peggy character, especially in copywriting, like how, like just the writing of the copy and you think about it, it's like how hard really was that? And then that's just an interesting mentality because I really do feel that way sometimes where I'm like, I could do that. I will I tell you. I could, I could totally do that, but I just don't. That's what the money is for. I don't want to yeah. infuse more Colin into like strengthening if anything capitalism needs to become a little weaker i need to do more to make capitalism <laughs> a little weaker you could definitely do that yeah. colin fuel capitalism yeah, yeah. exactly 
I will tell you that yep. once I went into public relations, you know, I had to start writing press releases that I was on the other side of things, right? Um, that shit was easy, dude. Hell yeah. That shit was easy. I wrote it's kind of funny press easy. releases. So I, huh? I know I, that was like, that was something I had to do. Yeah, you always got press releases, right? And yeah. uh, how easy did you think they were to write? Well, that's what I know. I was saying, I, I, I used to get, I was saying I wrote ours too, because we used to, we started making ours too, like when we announced the company and did all that. And I literally went yeah, to yeah. other, I went to like Games Press. Yeah. which is a, it was like a website that games media people use. Yeah. And I like just went and looked. I was like, how do you even do this? Like, okay, all capital letters for immediate yeah. distribution or whatever. Like just for I had no release. idea what the fuck I was doing. And then you just, and it totally, no one said anything about it. It was totally fine. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 so a lot of people think that doing PR is easy, right? Because running a press release is fucking easy. It, it is the easiest part of the job. Everything about PR be, besides the writing the press release is really, really hard. Getting the information, organizing events, blah, blah, blah. All that shit is really hard. But at least from my experience and obviously from Colin's experience, writing a press release is really, 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 really it's so fucking easy. Dude, I it's like to think about the Sony it. PR person probably really low on the totem pole that has to listen mm-hmm. to sacred symbols every week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people have to do they that. Definitely right? do. They definitely have to be. I mean, they in. definitely do. And yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, I'm like, who? What? About. What son of a bitch has to sit there and he like wants to fucking kill himself? There's somebody. And he's like, oh my god, the guy that, who. Yeah. Go go ahead. Oh, there's gonna be this guy wrote in again about how he shit on his couch and he has to listen to that. Not I mean, only he, he doesn't, you can't miss anything. Not only that is that they they have to write these reports and they present a lot of this stuff to like this is what people are yeah. saying and this is what oh, like right. big. PlayStation people are saying about our products and like I I just know because I know people in those conversations over time but I also just know every week I always think about that I'm like nothing there is nothing we say that they don't hear and yeah I love thinking about the low end PR person just out of school that's like ah fuck you know I have to sit here and re- listen to this shit you know, they're, ta- they're talking about predator catcher videos again for like the sixth time <laughs> <laughs> whatever you can say about sacred symbols we are definitely the number one podcast about talking about predator catchers Hell on yeah. youtube I- I'm, ha- I'm-, I'm happy to contribute to that to and that i told you gene i've said this before this is apropos of nothing considering what we're talking about right now but um i always looked at react content as the lowest form of content i've said that on sacred symbols mm-hmm. but the one thing that i've and i've said this to you is the one react content i would do is you and i on twitch reacting to public freakouts and fight videos but i don't even think we'd be able to do it because of, of like the rules on twitch but that would be the oh, one yeah, thing TOS. i would think would be hysterical you know it's and predator catcher funny. videos we could do like commentary over predator catcher videos yeah 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 that's hilarious that, that, I, I would love that just just just, just 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 to like maybe we could just do it on patreon or something yeah that would be enough. fucking hysterical it's just because <laughs> yeah. I, I, i'm coming out saying like yes this is the lowest form of content but it'll be so fun you know? yeah, it's, it's so fun <laughs> um <laughs> shit what was i gonna say i'm sorry yeah, um, i don't know what to do we're talking about writing. Yeah. Oh, press releases. Very right. easy. Hmm. Very easy to do. Very easy to do. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So ad, writing ad copy. I don't know if it's easy. I've, I, I've never really. Have I written ad copy before? I don't it becomes I very second nature. Like I'll give you an example. BetterHelp has been a long time sponsor of Sacred Symbols. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I really mm-hmm. believe in BetterHelp just because I, I use therapy and I think that like just access to therapy, like lowering the barriers. This is not a sponsorship thing. It's just like that. <laughs> no, is, but that helps. But it'll get you, to, yeah. to the point I'm making is like, yeah, lowering the barrier to entry it's not so unique to people who have insurance or the money or the access to it. So I really think it's a vital you know, service, but that's the point is I've written probably literally a hundred ads for better help at this point, if not more. And wow. so I can literally sit there without even looking at the ad copy at this point and be like, sometimes it'll be my, my own experience in therapy. Sometimes it'll be, a, sure. it's just always, and it's just always the same thing. And then before you know it, you're like, Oh, I've done this a hundred million times and mm. you just, and it just kind of flows out. But I'm always concerned, Gene, I think you'll appreciate this. And you've probably heard me say this is I and I make fun of people on sacred sometimes about this is like uh, I'm I am afraid for the people that are writing into the shows in this really illiterate way. And mm-hmm. then I ask them, you know, I'm like, you're not like emailing like this, are you or so like you're not in like a situation where you're looking for having you know, like corresponding in an office setting. It's like, God help you <laughs> if this is the way you write, you know, like I, I just I, there's just I don't know. How can we all have these phones in our hands at all times and always on the internet and you don't know how to read and write? That that to me is but a little more mysterious a than it was a hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It I mean it, it's entire generations though affected by it. Like I I always read at a relatively high level, but when I was in eighth grade, our teacher had to completely alter the curriculum because he chose the the book The Red Badge of Courage and no one could read it. 
Mm-hmm. And like there were a few of us who were enjoying the book and just because and th- th- this isn't like I don't mean this in a mean way, but we were in like eighth grade. Several of the kids were at a fourth or fifth grade reading level. Mm-hmm. We could not get through this book. <laughs> you know, he would assign one chapter a night and p- the kids just couldn't read it. I, I, he ended I, I, up I having to laugh, but I mean, it just it is. This was growing up in a low income school district yeah, of yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. And so it just was of like he had to change his whole curriculum. I'm only the laughing because I'm thinking about the about, about the the illiterate guys I know. Yeah. So and I'm thinking about them. Well, so. well, exactly, well the science teacher yelled at us because he was like, "You guys made Mr. Rucker change the book." And it's like, look, man, half these kids just can't read. Like it's just it is what it is. But and I I know by association an adult man who is 50 years old who's illiterate. Mm-hmm. And the guy works at a factory. His wife handles all the mail, all the bills. That's got to be and so hard. I mean, like anything, any letter that comes in the mail, she has to read That's it. So like, interesting. The man like, how can't do you not read? How Dude, do you? I don't. I, I understand how you get into that position as a kid, but how do you stay in that? And well, that's the thing. Like just literally, just making your way through high school. Teachers passing you because it was an agricultural community, and if mm. the reality is that teachers we're a little more willing to turn a blind eye when they say you are going to work at a factory. You are going right. to work on your dad's dairy farm. You right. don't need to, Expectations you don't need are this. Low. Yeah. It was just very different. I'm not saying it's still like that, you know, but like I had friends who dropped out because they weren't going to graduate. But the mm-hmm. reality was that the teacher still made it pretty easy. Like one teacher was like, if you do a hundred math problems, you'll pass. Like to one of my friends, he was like, I just want you to do these 100 math problems on this worksheet and wow. I will let you graduate. Well, mm-hmm. All right. One kid just had to read 200 pages and they were going to let him graduate. All right. It just was one of those things of like, look, they're trying to make it easy for you because they know that we're just a bunch of bumpkins from the country and we're not going to do anything anyways. So you might as well have a diploma to go get your job at the factory. Wow. But, but it was, it's like those expectations, depending on where you live, it's it's rough out there. And the reality is that, yeah, when I worked at like uh, at the college and some of the emails you'd get were just like, holy shit, man, can this guy read? Mm-hmm. It, it was just one of those things that like it, it's really stark depending on where you grew up and what the culture was like. Mm-hmm. That's what jur- journalism writing, at least when I was taught journalism writing, we were always taught to to write for the lowest common denominator. We were mm-hmm. always taught to write at a third grade, specifically a third grade reading level, because we were aware of of, of these of these stop gaps, I guess, in, in in American society. And it's like, okay, we we need we can't we can't use big words, you know. So for yeah, a long time, I, like I, I was just stuck in that writing of like this wow. happened and then this happened and then this happened, you know, wow. um, because that is the audience that that we're try, trying to write to. Um, so. It, it, so it's really funny to me to be at the Washington Post now and then like now, now I'm reading words that I don't fucking uh, I don't even fucking know. So, but then I got again I know illiterate guys who will read the word hatred and they'll be like, oh hat red, you know that's yeah. that's how the oh, word no. sounds that's how the word reads in them is is hat red. So I was like, oh that's a weird way to say red hat, you know. I gotta give a shout out. You rem- oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you remind me of my favorite Conan O'Brien joke in which Andy said, what's the national language of the United States? And he said, third grade English. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. It is. It is. That, that. That, that dead on. That's dead on. The, the, a lot of Americans aren't very good readers. And that just makes me wonder as a writer, what, what am I doing? You know? Yeah. I yeah, was who gonna, the fuck's I, reading it? I was going to recommend, I've, I've listened to, I've recommended it before, but the, the Emily Hanford mini series podcast series called Soul to Story is so fucked. And it's about, um, and I highly recommend it. It's about basically how there's, like you were saying, hat red. People used to be, used to be taught to identify and sound words out. And then there was this whole notion that you could teach kids to recognize words on site. And like basically changed the entire way kids read. And this began in the 80s and 90s and then started to kind of really infiltrate schools maybe 20 or 25 years ago. Mm. And this podcast really reveals that like this is the major reason why people can't read is because they <laughs> totally broke this age old, eons old way that we read yes. and tried to do something else. And they fucked everything up. And and it was bas- it's basically this small coterie of people that did it, like these mm-hmm. fake professionals that sold this bill of sale and are totally responsible for, mm-hmm. the, you know, that was you know, yeah, several so that's generations. Why we have entire generations that are completely fucked. Yeah, exactly. And it was because yeah, they simply said like, oh, you don't teach them how to sound it out. You teach them how to recognize the word. And they were saying it, it, it was crazy. Like they had these undercover almost audio bits of people doing. And 
to back up, it was COVID that basically was the impetus for this because people in, in houses started seeing their kids learning and being like, wait, what? And oh, like, right. they don't know, they don't know what the fuck they're doing They're They have, and the big thing was like guessing context. So like you would mm-hmm. be given a sentence and it would be like, the house is, and then it's like, so, and it's like red, big, two story demolish like what i don't know what you want me to do with this like the house is i don't know and that was like mm-hmm. how they were trying to teach kids how to read it was like basically like filling in the blank style shit and it, it was insane. a massive failure listen to it emily hanford sold a story it's the podcast it's That's a great scary. podcast series about it excellent um, anyone here yeah. used to write poetry i used to write poetry. Yeah. oh yeah oh, badly yeah. badly yeah Oh my god! I used to love writing yeah. bad poetry. Yeah, I would think bad. Yeah, yeah. too. I yeah. thought I was good, and then I just pulled up a couple of my poems right right in front of my face. They're so cringe. Like I was gonna, I, I, I thought about me. reading them out loud in the podcast. I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, <laughs> no, read one. Is this high school poetry? We were all bad. This is, this is high school poetry. Well, we thought we were good. I don't want to I'll, I'll read. Spot. I'll read. Uh, I'll read uh, the, the first two stanzas. Okay. okay. So it's called Orbicularis Oris or the Anatomy of a Kiss. This is the noise a kiss makes when pressed against the cheek of solitude. The weight of the world is on her lips under burden of solitude. The noise, the noise makes kiss. It holds delirium at bay across the endless fields. It cures the curse and the sickness and the brio. Grace to the mother, grace to the father. Kiss of memories, kiss of dreams, kiss of delight. The noise of a dream. I think that's anymore. pretty good I mean, that's for better high than anything poem. I ever wrote in poetry. I mean, oh my god! So. My god, Gene, I wrote a book of poetry in I guess it was, it was either AP English or Honors English. I'm not sure. We had the we had a poetry assignment. It was Operation Desert Storm, right? It was 91. So I wrote this anti-war screed in the form of 10 poems in a book that I had to put together manually. And it was called Toys of War. <laughs> and it was all just about how bad war is. Dude, I wish <laughs> I had it because your poem sounds like Dickinson compared to, I mean, it was, I knew it was bad while I was writing it. It was, just, do you know, poetry is like, it's permission to just do bad writing almost in high school, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's just like, all it's right. you're trying to like connect your emotions and be deep. Yeah, I, it's a mo- I have some, it's I have some something lyrical and musical a little bit with your words, right? Totally. So it sounds like a little like you know, like foo foo, you know. Totally. So I I have no. I still goes. have notebooks of stuff like that. I wrote like all my notebooks from high school are are in the attic of just random horrible writing, songwriting, remembrances, journal writing, and journaling, and all that kind of weird stuff. I I uh, I totally relate to that. It's a, yeah. I used yeah, to write songs permission too. to be avant garde, right? It's like I could just do anything. It's not like. You know, we again, like I remember writing book reports and just feeling like this writing is kind of a drag. It's too structured when, you know, when you tap into creative writing in high school, it's like before you learn the rules and before you learn to reel yourself in, it's just like, that's why it's so bad. Cause mm-hmm. it's like anything goes and it's, voca- I learned a new vocabulary word. I'm going to incorporate that. Gene, that was pretty, pretty, I would say pretty impressive. Yeah, I thought so too. Writing. Thank, thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely a lot of like words that I just learned. I think, uh, w- which I am still to this day. If you hear me use a, a word that you've never heard me say before, it's because I learned it an hour ago, and I'm I'm just <laughs> I'm just trying to just trying to flex using it now. Yeah, and think, it's a way to it's a way to learn. Podcaster does that. Yeah, I mean, really I mean, that's how it. you learn. Because, again, yeah, the only right. way you can the only way you can write is the, the is the only is by reading. The only way you can be a good podcaster is probably by listening to other podcasts and also be a podcast. Agree. You know. I do a lot agree of, with a lot of folks in the audience talk about, you know, how my podcasting and my talking ability is, you know, like not quite up there, but it's like, I'm, I'm learning too, you know, you're doing great. I, I mean, no, you do, I, I will, great dude, we were just remarking, Mike and I just a couple of days ago, like, like we love having you on board. We love having you in the family. Like it's been such a, uh, it's been an unexpected, you know, boon for us. And I think the audience too. Exactly. And I think for you, because you've been exposed to a whole different group of people too, that, um, you know, in terms of your, you know, our fan base kind of becoming your fan base and your fan base coming, kind of becoming parts, parts of our fan base. Now, some yeah, of your fan true. base hate us and that's okay, but all <laughs> of okay. us love you, you know? So. Yes. Yeah. And Gene, in light of that, Colin and I, Wink, have a little proposition for you, no. but we'll save that for another time. <laughs> oh, oh, <God. laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Indecent proposal. Um, Dig, are you well, well, I also like this, 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 this gathering of foes because it's very much like family oriented. And then here I am, the, the, the fourth wheel outside the family. Oh, no, you know? dude. 
your family for us. It's all good. Yeah. Dig, are you? I, I, I liked when you said I'll, I'll, I'm all up on LSM's guts. Yeah, you're all up in them guts. <laughs> all up in the guts. Ugh, it's so gross. <laughs> Balls deep. Just, just the way you say it. Ow. <laughs> Dig, are you, uh, are you satisfied? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to, to the scribes, the LSM scribes for weighing in. I mean, who knows? I might, 2024 might be the first year I write full time. I keep saying to Helene, like, did I, should I have listened to my teachers 25 years ago, 30 years ago? Did I, was I just spinning my wheels? Because you know what the thing is? Animation, Colin was talking about OCD before. Like it re, it's hard for me because I have a lot of OCD when it comes to animating, but I don't have that with writing. So there's a freedom with writing. I take it seriously, but it's not the same level of, you know, being neurotic and being compulsive mm. and spending countless hours that I'm not getting paid for at night to make things a little better and a little more polished. There's there's something with writing that I think is going to be, you know, full time on the clock, 40 hours a week that I think is going to be good for me, for, you know, just in terms of relieving a little bit of that. Be a lot easier than what you're doing now. I can tell you that as a person. Who I think so. Yeah. I think so. As someone who does write professionally and who is a little bit obsessive about their writing, like I do, like my Alan Wake 2 review, I was up mm -hmm. until 5 a.m. The, the other day writing it. Um, only because I was like, okay, there's, there's still, like, I, I was literally like Alan Wake. I was like, there's still more to write. Like, what, like what's in the game? What, when am I forgetting? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but I will also say that I'm not very attached to my writing either. I'm, I'm very, very easy to edit. If Colin was ever my editor, I'd be, like, I, I don't give a shit what, what you edit. You know, and that's one thing. And that's one, another takeaway I took from, from the Philip Mewson uh, conversation is that he was very, very like, he, he could not take being edited. He could not take the criticism. He could not take like, hey, maybe you could say this a little better or maybe you could say that a little better. And he that was will, being like, precious with stolen words. Well, yeah, I mean, that too. <laughs> Or is so that why weird. he stole them? He was, I, that he might was be why he stole them because like, like he, he thought that he like whatever he was doing was not good enough, so he had to take it from someone else. It's oh, for, yeah. I understand. Yeah. For me, and you can you can ask every editor I've ever had, they will tell you Gene is the easiest person that I've ever edited because he does not give a shit. Like he I I do not give a shit. And then like many editors who have come out is like, yeah, can confirm Gene does not give a shit. He's so easy to edit for because it's just like like I, I have no personal attachment to that and i see a lot of other games writers struggle with that because like you know they come from creative writing and they come from features writing where like they put so much of themselves into it and you know like well like one of the most the, one, one of the most pissed off things i was with other games journalists was when i when i told when i tweeted out news writers writers you you can't care about your article you can't care about your, what, what you're saying if if there's news and you you got to write it just fucking write it and publish it and worry about it uh, worry about the words later right and then like you know that fucking uh one of the kataka the, the the guy who wrote the fucking ps5 and and, and trump article oh uh whatever. ian ian fisher or whatever yeah, yeah something know. like that yeah i, I don't know it, 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 you, he already fading into memory right but he was like don't write like this you you should put put passion into all your work and i'm just like shut like yeah, who fucking, the fuck shut, are you <laughs> wow. first of all who the fuck are you <laughs> shut the fuck up and then secondly i'm not even talking to you you fucking loser like do you know how many like young like journalists like actually follow me young journalists who work in like local newspapers local TV stations who are actually, who are doing like actual journalism or who are trying to get the news out who are under pressure and facing a real fucking deadline. Unlike you, you know, I'm not fucking talking to you. you yeah. Know? I looked, I look at, I looked up Ian Walker. Oh yeah. Ian Walker. Still without, still without writing work after getting laid off by Kotaku. I think that's going to remain wow. permanent for you, my friend. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. All right. Let's move on. All right, we have two topics left, more serious ones now. Gene, I leave it over to you since I think mine probably probably will be intrinsically political for some people, and so I want them to be able to, to avoid it if they want mm -hmm. to. So I leave it to you. I think mine would be a little political too. Um, and I have to be careful about what I say. But my topic is about crime. Um, and uh, I guess our relationship with crime. But I mostly talk about this because, uh, and, and I can talk about my own history with crime and criminality and the criminal elements. Uh, obviously, I, uh, I am a former crime reporter, so I have a long, long, deep history with, with you know, talking to criminals and talking to police and understanding, uh, you know, uh, 
crimes in neighborhoods, right? Um, <clears throat> but in D.C., we are kind of facing a crisis right now where uh, there is a huge crime wave going on in, in the nation's capital. Uh, and the Metropolitan uh, Police Department actually has a r- r- really cool uh, table up where uh, they update the, the, the crime stats. So violent crime total in 2023 is 40% higher than it was last year. Uh, 4,961 shit. incidents of violent crime versus 3,550. 3, um, 69% increase in robbery. Uh, 32% increase in homicide. 250 uh, uh, murders as opposed to 189 last year, a 92% increase in Grand Theft Auto or motor vehicle theft, 6,372 versus 3,314 last year. Thank you, Hyundai. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and a 24% uh, increase in theft. And right now, uh, the D.C. City Council is uh, hearing a bill by our mayor uh, to kind of change the laws because a lot of the laws that we that we passed in recent years were in reaction to kind of like that whole defunding the police um, uh, uh, cry where they're kind of not really defunding the police but kind of police re- reform. So right now the law is that officers are interpreting the law is that when there's a carjacking or a grand theft auto incident, uh, they can't chase. There, there, there will be no car chase. Period. They're not gonna go after the criminal at all, you know, uh, because it might be against the law. Because I guess the argument is is that police chases are more dangerous to the, to the general public than just catching one car theft, uh, car thief. So like one woman actually had her little her little Apple tag. Uh, she basically showed the police exactly where the car was going. And she was telling the cops, I was like, look, he's on, he's on the freeway or he's on the street. Go get him. And he's like, we can't do that, man. And he's like, what are you talking about? I we know where he is. And he's like, we can't, we can't chase him. But we're going to wait until the car stops moving. And then we think that the car is abandoned and then we'll go get it. Mm-hmm. And then that's exactly what happened. And, and then the car showed up and it was all ruined and jacked up. But then she got her car back, I guess, you know. Um and then also, there's just like random shootings. The the, the other week, uh, there was, uh, or d- d- I think earlier this week, there was a f- footage of a, a neighborhood where uh, this guy was running away from like 20 dudes like firing guns at him. Uh, and it looks comical. It looks really, really hilarious when you see, first of all, this guy fucking like running and ducking all these, this, this hailstorm of bullets and like a bunch of dudes like trying to, sh- trying to kill him and missing. Uh, the sad thing is that they hit a, a dog walker, uh, just a woman who was just an innocent by, bystander, you know, and we get that a lot. You know, there, there's a lot of people getting hit and everything. So I just I just uh, like I don't know. I can't really say anything because obviously it's, it's very political and it's a political issue. It is in the city council. It is in it, it is the most political we can get. Um, so I can't really comment on how I feel or what I think we should be done. All I will say is that I definitely feel, as a resident of D.C., very unsafe. Um, you know, there, there, there's a street called H Street, which was supposed to be like the new hipster, revitalized, uh, gentrified area. And that completely failed. And it's a, a complete shit, shithole now. Uh, it's, it, it is. The, D.C. is becoming what Trump would call a shithole country, right? Or a shithole town. Mm-hmm. A little bit, um, and and I, I've seen it develop over the years. I, I've seen it happen over the years. Where when I first moved here, it was a lot safer, and just over the last few years, definitely during the pandemic, um, mm-hmm. it escalated to uh, a, a boiling point where people are just doing crime. And I myself, I, I'm a I'm a victim of these crimes too. I've been jumped twice, and I was robbed once. Um, one time I was just this was in the southwest neighborhood where I used to live in DC. Where I was just outside, uh, you know, the 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 new Beyonce album came out. And I was listening to the new Beyonce album. And I was just smoking a cigarette, and then just out of nowhere, a bunch of kids just came up and, and started hitting me, and then they, they left. Holy shit! And I was like, "What the fuck was that?" You know, Jeez. they didn't rob you. Uh, they didn't rob me or anything. <coughs> they, 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 it was clearly some kind of initiation ritual or some kind of prank or or something. Sure. Where there's like, hey, let, 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 just just beat that beat the shit out of that guy for a bit, you know. Um, and then another one where I was coming. This is both that night. By the way, but you know, all these crimes happen during the day too. It's crazy. Uh, but the other time was when I was just walking home and I was just on my phone, and then you know, three guys were just walking up to me, and I was just, oh, just three guys, whatever. And then they just jumped me and took my phone. 
And then uh, I called the cops and nothing happened. And, you know, I got my ass beat and I had to get a new phone and it sucked. Uh, And so all of this is just to say, I just don't feel safe. And I've seen this before, uh, but I've, I guess I've never really been in a place this violent before because I have grown up in the Pacific Islands. And most of the violent crime that happens, uh, especially in Hawaii, I don't know about now, uh, but at least when, when I was living there up in, from 2006 to, to, to 2015, uh, the violent crime was uh, usually uh, crimes of passion. Um, usually the, the murder would be because <laughs> the, the guy is killing their wife or something, you know. Or as a family member or something, uh, you know. The, the, I did cover murders where they were drug related, uh, and you can always tell they were drug related because it was always between two people who didn't know each other, um, and uh, the, the, so that was always really easy to figure out. Hmm. Um, yeah, right now, uh, the you know they're looking at um, uh, the bills to 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 restrict drug free zones and everything. I was like, I don't know if that's gonna work. Um, but do you want to leave? Do there. you want to leave Washington, or do you want to live there for? I, oh, I totally want to leave DC, dude. Uh, I, I oh, am wow. absolutely in the mentality of just I, I want to. I want to leave this shithole town. Where would you like leave, to go? I want to leave cities. Yeah. Oh I yeah. Me too. To I'm New never York living city. in a city again. I don't want to move to New York City. I don't want to move to San Francisco. I don't really want to move to Los Angeles, even though I think in LA you you can kind of get away with like living in a neighborhood. You know. You know. You can live at fucking Torrance or whatever. Sure. Yeah. You know. Um, Definitely. And you can be fine there, right? Um, but. Yeah, I don't want to live in like a centralized city anymore. I don't want to live in fucking Austin, Texas. I seen that fucking video of that guy, uh, that the Colin uh, of, of of that guy who has the fucking four K videos. Oh yeah, it's monster- it's <laughs> Texas street fights. Yeah, yeah, Texas street fights, and it's like it's 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 super super like 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 it's like Christopher Nolan. Yeah, like, it's the like, highest incredible. quality. I, I have no idea how he does it. Like, yeah, and he's always at the right place at the right time. It's crazy, and it's on that Sixth Street in Austin. I'm yeah, talking yeah. with Eugene, where like I don't. I lived in city. I lived in Boston for five years, San Francisco for what ten years, and then mm-hmm. L.A. for three years. And I never want to live in this. I will. I won't ever live in a no, city. No, no, no. Boston, just, f- Philly. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. The, Nashville. Is also, Nashville is probably the biggest city. I'll probably get. I'll, I'll probably I, move not to be you know? not to be dark or whatever, but I'd like to be dark for a second. Is that in in bad political or social or economic situations, the last place you want to be is a city. Yeah, that, that's for damn sure. So I, as things seem to get worse and worse, I'm like, I'm kind of early. that's what I say all the time, Gene, is that my experience out here is so different than than the experience in, in a city where we actually and this is you'll appreciate this. We had this thing in the last couple of weeks in our neighborhood where someone was breaking into people's cars. Mm. And this was a big thing for two reasons. One was we live in a pretty nice neighborhood. Not, it's not like the most upper class, like cr- crazy neighborhood, but it's it's probably what I would consider upper middle class, maybe. Mm-hmm. And you just don't, as Mike was saying, you don't really expect that to happen here. And the other thing was that it was so weird that it happened that everyone was talking to each other about it mm-hmm. to the point where it was like the big scuttlebutt. Our neighbor across the street who we're friendly with, um, this couple, she she texts me and she's like, I know you're not on the Facebook groups and stuff, but just to let you know, people are breaking into cars. And then, Micah went and looked at her car and found that someone did break like they, they didn't oh. break a window, but like opened the door and like rifled through things in there. Then we realized that we had it on. Oh, shit. We like our security camera picked it up. We had to figure out how to get it off there because we had never used it before. And uh, oh, what, what, but what was so interesting was even when the, and this is why I'm not it was annoying that I'm well, not annoying. It was like, wow, that kind of sucks. That's like, you know, an infringement on your rights in some way. And it's also kind of not to be an asshole, kind of bold to do in a neighborhood like this because I would imagine half my neighbors will blow you the fuck away if you try Mm. that kind of try. Mm. So it's a little, it's a little bit like, seriously, I mean, it's just, it's a kind of a different, a little bit of a different culture down here. Mm. I wouldn't fuck around down here if I were you, but Mm -hmm. um, certainly if you come into someone's house, I mean, you're done. You're certainly done in this house. Mm -hmm. Uh, So um, I I would think about buying a gun. You know, you should. I mean, and, 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 one is not the first time, but two, this is the first time, but it's not one. It's not the first time I thought about buying a gun. No, uh, as some of you might not might know, I was registered to 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 to, to, to uh, I was registered to hold in Hawaii, so I wouldn't mind doing that here and just, yeah, just buying in peace, you know. Yeah, you. I mean, I don't, I don't blame anyone. Washington, San Francisco, New York. Some some of these places just seem. Here's the thing I want to say about this is, well, what I was actually wrapping up my old point first was what I, what was so interesting and kind of reaffirming about where I am right now, and that is that like 
th- that action or like that that was shared experience between the neighbors made it, it's like everyone dude people were stopping us when we were walking our dogs being like hey did you hear about the mm. people breaking in the cars and like getting text messages and our neighbor was asking us about it and all this sort of stuff so like everyone's all over it mm-hmm. and that's kind of the mentality i'm i'm wondering and i don't know how others feel about this is i see these videos of crime and frankly, a lot of what I said about that people were upset about during the, the riots in 2020 were to- was totally right. I was like, this is completely lawless and insane. This is going to be used as the template for future activities. And people are always going to say, why didn't you do anything about that? Why didn't you do anything about that? Why didn't you do anything about that? And so and so it became that way 100 percent. And that was when I realized and that is when crime started going up. We've one an important thing to note, Gene, is and you know, this is that like crime. America was safer than ever. Like. 10 years ago, like it has sure. never been safer in, in mm-hmm. the United States ever, like going all the way back to the 1780s. Yep. And th- COVID kind of broke that. And I look at this and I'm like, why are people getting away with this stuff? Like there's, you see these videos. I, 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 re- I remarked that my old CVS in Santa Monica, there was a video of it getting ransacked during the riots. Right. Mm-hmm. And you could just see people's faces and who it's like, they, they're just getting away with it. Like there's no, we, we are, especially in urban areas making the situation where it's like no you just go in you just go into the store and steal whatever you want no mm-hmm. security guards are just going to watch it happen you mm-hmm. go with your friends and run into a really boutique store at a mall and just steal all the merchandise no one's going to go after you 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 know go into target and steal all of the tvs during a riot no one's going to stop you mm-hmm. i don't know that to me is crazy and and people are always like oh the rise of fascism the rise of fascism i'm like you know what the fuck the rise of fascism is going to come in and is if you let this country continue to go berserk then mm-hmm. you're going to get a strong man and you're going to miss Donald Trump because the, the strong man that fixes that kind of shit is going to be way crazier. That's the kind of stuff you beg for when you let this stuff run amok. That's why I'm confused about mm-hmm. it. And I've, I've really observed that. And it frustrates me because I'm like, dude, this isn't a mystery. Remember, there's that joke. I don't know who it was that told the joke about how people used to dress up in suits and ties, go to the bank and rob it and then fucking use a machine gun to spray paint their name in the fucking wall and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And and they would just get away with it. Like no one would, you know, we're the Tracy, <laughs> we're the Tracy boys, you see? Yeah. And they like shoot hey, up the see? wall and they like, and like you never see them again. Yeah. And I love that. It's like such a funny joke. It's true. Like they would dress in suits. They would just be there for like two hours. Like hey, no Mac, one would open catch the them. vault, Mac. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and now yeah. we have this like whole thing where it's like on camera, just totally. And they're just, dude, no one's going and knocking on doors and being like, were you there? Like, is this you? Mm-hmm. You're coming with us. Because like, that's the kind of shit, if I was in a city, I'd be like, that's what we're doing is we're going to, w- this target got raided like that. We're going to go through this video and get every one of these motherfuckers, mm-hmm. you know, and make an example out of all of them. And I don't see that happening, which is why I think crime runs amok. It's the same thing with carjacking. They had the nerve and Dagan made the joke, but they have the nerve in Washington to say like, oh, maybe Kia and Hyundai or whatever, or whatever companies are getting targeted. Maybe they should fix their shit. And it's like, maybe you shouldn't have a society where people are stealing people's cars. Mm-hmm. You fucking kidding? Mm-hmm. You know? It's so I, and then, and, and, and then, the, and then yeah, there's sorry. reduced sentences too, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, again, I don't want to say too much because you can. I feel like you can read between the lines of what I think. But then, like you know, there are reduced sentences where people who are stealing things get probation. So there's just not a lot of dude. Uh, and of course, on the other side, you know, people reform in New York. You, you, you don't want to have like a prison nation and a prison state of blah blah blah. You know, but. I don't know. You only get see. I'm I'm a, a reformer too. Like I don't. I think mm-hmm. this prison system is completely out of control in the United States. But this yeah. is not what we're talking about. Like I'm not. We're not saying like oh everyone just does whatever they want. What I'm saying mm-hmm. is like should you be in jail for a drug offense for 20 years if you sold marijuana? Should you be doing life in prison? Like that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about someone saying mm-hmm. I'm going to go in and steal shit like five thousand mm-hmm. dollars worth of merch from Target. It's like you should be in prison mm-hmm. for that. Like I, that's not, and what I was saying, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you was like in New York yeah. city, bail reform is a fucking disaster where you don't even have to put up anything to get bailed out. Mm. You just get bailed out and then people mm. get arrested over and over. And they know, by the way, that these are all misdemeanors like, oh, don't just don't steal more than $700 worth of stuff and mm. you'll be good. It's crazy. Like I, you can't you almost can't blame the criminality. It's the same way I used to feel about in, in San Francisco with the 10 cities and stuff. It's like this is crazy, but no one's doing anything about it. Why, why wouldn't mm-hmm. you want to just live in the fucking Golden Gate Park? It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. You don't mm-hmm. have to pay for anything. They're not going to bust your balls here. You got showers. Yeah. Same, same in Hawaii. You know, the, the, the weather's beautiful year round, right? So why wouldn't you just want to li- li- live on the beach? And you, yeah, you got showers on the beach, too. You know. So anyway, I'm ranting and raving already. Dig. 
we'll kick it over to you. Uh, Gene's topic here of crime. What, what, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, man. I mean, I, I love the suburbs, but I really love our great American cities. Like, I, I'm sad about this. You know, for me, I, I take it personally. Like, it wasn't even cute when the West Coast cities were crumbling, like Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, LA. Like, the cities I honestly have no emotional investment in. That wasn't even fun. Now the East Coast, like Boston, Philly, and New York, no. Now it's, I feel like it's personal. I feel like it's sad that you don't have the choice to live in the cities. I feel like our great American cities are something to be proud of. You're waiting for the next step in the process, right? Chicago, Atlanta, Austin, like it's just, it seems like this giant domino effect. I mean, I could give you the Philly perspective. This was really eye-opening for me, actually. I guess I noticed it going on. But it really, this idea really got cemented last weekend. We had Helene's 30th high school reunion, and we saw a lot of her old friends and classmates from the area, you know, that grew up in the Philly suburbs. And like us, a lot of them have kids either already early in college or about to embark on college, you know, in the next year or two. And no one's going to Temple anymore, Temple University, which is a huge, Mm. important, very well regarded college in, in downtown Philly. Just, just into the cusp of North Philly. Nobody's going anymore because the crime is so bad in wow. Philly. Wow. Dude, Philly and looks so bad on the internet right now. Like It's it- very – Philly is really crumbling. I mean, it's it's no different than what you hear about Seattle, West, uh, you know, Vancouver, any of those places. It's like zombie apocalypse type levels. And I see – I did notice there's this thing of people like our kids, our local kids going across the state to pit. And I'm, I realized like the last three years, Pitt in Pittsburgh is becoming Temple because everybody wants their kid to feel safer and it kind of acquiesce like I would rather my kid go five or six hours away than be an hour away in, in the Wild West, essentially. And, you know, Pittsburgh, I think Pittsburgh is declining, but it's a much smaller city, has less than a half a million people, much smaller There's city, an enormous amount of money city. there too, with like not being spent necessarily, but a latent amount of money. Didn't we talk yeah. about a, a few episodes ago? Like there's more, it's something like there's more like AI or something money being spent in Pittsburgh than everywhere else combined. Oh, I don't know. Or some, there was something crazy like that with, uh, with John, Johns Hopkins and all the different institutes there. Like they keep it kind of on the up and up. Carnegie Mellon. Car- yeah, um, Carnegie, yeah Car- like they keep, they keep it on the up and up, like with their, their that's very, interesting. Yeah, so that's, and I think that's what I could see yeah. people kind of retreating to the smaller, safer, at least, you know, so far safer, you know, quote unquote, safer cities. And, I, but you see it, it's, it's a shame. I'm sure like temples, you know, recruitment has gone down, you know, they're in the basement. So I, I could see that firsthand. And I think, you know, it's kind of, I remember being in Philly, going to college in the mid to late nineties. And it was, it was being in a big city, but it was a much different feel. Like, I, I don't know why this is the first thing I thought of when Gene brought up this topic via email, but I, I remember when I first started waiting tables in Philly, I was in center city. Mm. Thank God my friend Adam rescued me from retail hell and said, dude, you're managing a skate shop. You can make this much money in one or two nights. Like, what are you doing type of thing? So, and it would be on a good weekend night, I would have like three or $400 cash walking home from center city to like shallow South Philly, but far enough walking at 11 o'clock at night in a big city where you had to be on your toes. Mm-hmm. You know, I had my wad of money stuffed into my shoe, stuffed into my sock, always on guard had a strategy, knew what path to take, knew which alleys to dive, you know, to to kind of dive down if something looked amiss. But thinking even then, like, all right, this is going to catch up to me. I was the only one in my friend circle who wasn't mugged at least once. You know, that I just got lucky. Now I can't even imagine, you know, like Gene's saying, being in that urban environment now how much worse it's got. I don't know. I, t- I take it personally. I think it's a, I think it's offensive, you know, that my, my kids can't even consider going to school. I think I, you know, like Helene's parents, their greatest fear is Lilia going to school in New York right now. Like they're so happy to hear her talking about Savannah because they're just, they're just relieved. She's not going to be in midtown Manhattan, you know, at this point. 
as she's kind of and and these are not the reasons why she thought that it's just fortunate that you know she's she wants to be near the beach and you know because she was really gung ho about going to FIT or Parsons for years you know leading up to this so I mean that's that's the thing with this is that. I don't know. Like you see, you're on social media. I don't even tune into social media daily, but there is, like Colin was saying, there's this uptick seemingly in crime where people are just brazenly walking into these box stores or department stores and just ripping pocketbooks off the rack or taking an armful of jackets and stuffing it into the trunk of the car and everybody's filming it. Obviously, you know, your first thing is like, well, everybody has a everybody has a camera on their person now. So all these things are being recorded, but there's a clear uptick in just not just these things occurring but the fact that people know it's not going to be punished even though you can't commit one of these crimes without being on candid camera it's impossible you can't like you're saying even Micah's car getting rifled through it's on your ring cam or whatever you guys have hooked up yeah you know it's, it's I mean? uh so- that's the frustrating thing to me dig is just why wouldn't criminality grow when there are no consequences? There are no consequences. It's very mm-hmm. weird that that's mm-hmm. okay. It's, it is strange to me that there's even a debate that we need a law and order style candidate. Like, you, of course you do. Are you kidding me? And, and this kind of uh, criminality is just, I think the, re- the, the reality of all of this, and I think it could just goes back to this, is that there's just so many different experiences within this country economically, societally, politically, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth, that people live in these little in these little pockets, sometimes big pockets, they're huge rural areas or whatever, where they're like, well, and I've kind of feel this way in some sense, and I hate to say it, it's like, you vote for this. Yeah. And if this is what you're going to continue to vote for, that's your problem, because mm-hmm. that kind of shit is not happening here. Mm-hmm. And it would never happen here. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, it just, so to me, I, I feel bad feeling that way, but it's kind of like, part of the balkanization frankly of the united states that's ongoing anywhere it's like fine man here in our red county nothing you can leave your bike outside i i I said before there was a kid that left his bike outside with his fucking iphone on it for like two days next door and it just was sat there that's crazy i would have stolen that (laughs) (laughs) you know like it just sat there like kids and we say that all the time like even i grew up we grew up in a pretty nice part of long island but we wouldn't leave our toys out and shit like that. People would steal them. I mean, like your shit would get stolen eventually. And, and so we live in a place where it's like much more comfortable than that. And I'm like, and, and my, and I think that's what stops the overarching. And maybe that's reasonable is to say like, listen, that's your problem. But if, because you just continue to vote for, and we were talking about um, the uh, defund the police. The reality is, is that some people tried to worm their way out of that, but it's like, no, you said what you said and you meant what you meant and you made it pretty clear. And that's pretty crazy. Like that's fucking crazy that you think that the, the, the definition or the, uh, the solution or the solve to crime is, is fewer police. And then you see, and Gene, I know you're well aware of this. You see the polling where it's black communities that are saying like, we don't want that. Are you fucking kidding? That's, we don't want fewer police. It's the fucking white liberal obnoxious people that get to escape Washington and go to Fairfax. Right. Or wherever, where they they get to have those kinds of opinions and they get to say that kind of shit and they get to push that kind of shit. I, I, I hate the, the fucking Twitter user that there was one Twitter user or whatever who fucking came into D.C. And was I walk around DC? I was like, "Oh, look at all the war zone here!" And he's by fucking like Salvatore for for Gamo or whatever. I'm like, "You are you? First of all, you're not even like 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 the rough neighborhoods, right? You're, you're not even rem- remotely close to them, you know." Uh, second of all, you know, Capitol Hill itself, even Congress Hill, is there is there's a like like a Congress person and an FBI agent. They both got robbed, you know. Like right, an FBI agent is carrying a gun. A Congress still got robbed. He, he still got carjacked. I'm sorry, Colin. What was that? I, I'm sorry, Gene. I didn't mean to speak over you. I was saying he's still. Yeah, he got a, a congressperson got carjacked. Exactly. So I was saying, yeah, that's so uh, that's so. Yeah, crazy. and an FBI agent just got carjacked too. How can that be allowed to happen? Yeah, that's crazy. Because could, could I don't I don't think people are even thinking this through. Where it's like, okay, you car you carjack a congressman. Did you kidnap the congressman? Could you king- kidnap the congressman? Could you hold the congressman ransom? I mean, like this is pretty serious security him? concern. Yeah. yeah, kill him. It's like. He's a, an elected member of the House of Representatives. It's serious and should be serious for anyone. But if it's not serious for that, then that shows you how fucked <laughs> the whole paradigm is. Anyway, Micah, uh, where are you on this? Yeah, so I grew up 
in a very small community, like my hometown, I think we Googled it recently, it has like 17,000 people. So the scale for me is that like I live now at a very big place. And the, the reality is that it's not. But to me, that's how it feels. Because I, I certainly agree with Gene when, you know, my hometown had crime, but it wasn't like random crime. Mm. It was like there was a murder suicide. You know, some guy killed his wife. Like that stuff happened. Yeah, that, um, it's always a murder suicide. Usually that happens a lot, you know, which is right. which always sucks. It is horrible, of course. Well, yeah. Exactly. Or my hometown was. You know, hopefully you don't marry somebody who would murder you and then kill themselves. That's, hopefully. That, that's, that's the American dream right there, Colin. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Fingers crossed. It's uh, <laughs> what my hometown was a little bit famous because in the 1980s there was a murder right around Halloween and they didn't catch the guy for several oh. like they didn't find him for a while um and like Halloween was basically canceled that year like parents wouldn't let their kids out because there's this murder on the loose and the story was pretty crazy because he killed this twin sister but he meant to kill the other one and so it really oh. was just like straight out of a movie type thing. And it's Dude. right around Halloween. It was just, but it was like things like that happened occasionally. There was a joke. There's a street, you know, called Hope Street in my hometown, which multiple people were murdered on Hope Street, like different times. There was the machete murders. There was the golf club murder. Like this, it was this horrible street called Hope Street that people just kept dying in. That's awesome. It's like a it's like a, <laughs> like a video game. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality was that while those crimes happen, we also would have things like you check the police reports. And this is like one that ended up on the Ellen show was that somebody called because they're chickens. You know, there were chickens in the street. And when the cops got there, they were gone. And, and they wrote in the police report, the chickens must have crossed the road, which ended up on Ellen for her like funny police <laughs> sketch. But it was like, that was the level of like small town crime. I sent uh, one to my, uh, to our cousin recently, because my, one of my friends is always posting from the police scanner. And there was one of them was like, dog up on a roof, you know, homeowner notified. Like that's the type of stuff that the cops get called for. And then occasionally there's a murder. But for the most part, there wasn't a ton of crime. It was just like, well, occasionally something really bad happens. That all kind of changed when I was in high school and like the heroin epidemic started. Mm. That is when stuff got a little more sketchy. You know, I had several classmates die, but it just was of like, that was kind of even the worst of it. But it was still just like, well, most of this is just, it's drug crimes. I don't mean to minimize that, but it's like, it's not even people getting mugged or like shot or anything it's for the most part like oh some guy got caught with a bunch of heroin and so even still it's not even necessarily like violent mm -hmm. crime so so I, I grew up in just a very unique rural place where the cops getting called for because some guy had weed in his mud room and when he went downstairs it was stolen he reported his stolen weed <laughs> like stuff like that would happen and this was before weed was legal <laughs> you know just so that's kind of what i grew up with when my car got rifled through the other day i felt like like this had literally never happened to me in my life that somebody had like attempted to steal something from me it's a violation they, of safe space yeah. well right and it, because it was i'm 30 years old and this had never happened before because yeah. i remember i went out to my car and i was just like i just noticed like yeah the glove box was open and stuff had been taken out they didn't take anything because i guess they didn't want anything i had they didn't want my reba mcintyre cds but it was <laughs> like i felt immediately like sick to my stomach and colin i don't mean this in a bad way colin was like kind of brushing it off like it's okay but i was like it doesn't feel okay like this is the first time in my life that someone has you know gone through my stuff mm -hmm. and attempted to steal from me i feel like sick right now you I think know Colin's just trying to be a reassuring strong boy it I was wasn't boy reassuring. I was boyfriend, husband, you know? <laughs> yeah i was i well i i, I also tried to, okay, put, honey, I okay. to put in the yeah. content yeah i don't want to be like oh my god this is the worst thing ever i mean I just, like <laughs> yeah you're absolutely right oh my god what we're gonna do i don't think that that would have been an appropriate response but yeah. i was also trying to just say that my experiences <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, Mike? I'm sorry. I said a hug would have been an appropriate oh, response. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's like we can't go like one episode without me like getting getting destroyed by Mike. Like, You're a husband now. Like, I don't understand this at all. Like, it's like it's like look, my mission is to make Colin look as bad as possible. Oh as my slowly God. as possible. <laughs> Michael, uh, was your car locked or did you leave it unlocked? No, that's what makes me so mad because I always lock my car 
because mm. I didn't grow up in a very nice place, especially when I lived alone. But it was just the complacency of having lived here for a couple of years. And you do see it. You see children leave their iPhones out in their front yard for days and they don't get stolen and you just grow complacent. I generally do lock my car every time I come home. The times that, that I would forget was grocery shopping because I get home, I unload all the groceries, Colin's usually recording. So like, I'm just doing that by myself. I come inside, I got to put away the groceries. That And that's literally what happened. If I grocery shopped on that Friday and just forgot to lock the car, didn't use my car again for several days. But it's like, that's when it happens of, yeah, because I just they have to bring in all the groceries, put them away, absent-minded. But generally, no, I would always lock the car. I'm obsessive about locking the house. Um, like that would be a never. I would never in a million years feel comfortable not locking the doors to our home. And that's something that whenever there is like some sort of crime back home, the police are always reminding people to lock their doors because that's the type of place it is. Like people leaving their doors and windows unlocked all the time. And we were never like that, though, because my mom is from the city and was like, no, 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 we lock. Everything's locked here. You know, don't. But it was that made me so mad because it was like the one time I forgot because that complacency kind of set in. And I noticed the difference, though, of our neighbors. You constantly hear the toot toot of the horn when like they're locking their car to make sure it's locked. You used to never hear it around Mm. here. And now you hear it constantly. And it's like, yeah, everybody's on the same page of, well, this neighborhood isn't quite as safe as we thought it was. It's, it's disappointing for sure. I, I also like, I don't even know if, if if they got anything good, generally speaking, talking to our neighbors, it doesn't sound like they were very successful thieves because people aren't stashing stuff in their cars really. And I mean, what are you going to take? Nobody's got like an expensive Garmin and no one wants it if you have one, right? Like who wants your GPS? It's free in your phone. Like most of the stuff that people could steal, they don't even really want it. And nobody's like stealing stereos anymore. Like the big thing back home is stealing catalytic converters. Well, that's under the car. You got to have a little bit of skill to get one. So that's not like your average teenager just, you know, going through the cars. But it was, it was scary. And it's just disappointing. Only because it's just to realize like, yeah, people, the world is still shit. <laughs> like you live in this nice little pocket of you know the country and it's generally speaking very very great Mm. but then something like that happens it's just a reminder of like yeah you know but it's not all good yeah Uh, of of course you know how magnified that shittiness is in a city you know yeah well that's the thing i've literally i've never lived in a city ever well that's why my reaction that's why my reaction to that was so like it was basically like the i've been party to or even involved in not on the perpetrator side but like so many things that were like exponentially worse than that that i was like i don't know man it's a, it, 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 it's sad that that happened i'm glad that everyone's self-aware of it but it didn't seem like that big of a deal for based on, i was telling her some stories like um my ex a long time ago that i dated in san francisco for years got her license plates stolen both of her license plates stolen and then put on another identical make and model car in china in chinatown part of san francisco oh. and they ran up mega amounts of tickets on that and then like basically abandoned the plates and Mm -hmm. shit like that and my friend nate who was at my wedding someone crawled in through his window in the hate and like stole all of his shit out of his room once and broke in through their laundry room another time and stole stuff so i was just like and i i've had stuff stolen from me and my wallet was stolen and like all sorts like so that was kind of why my reaction was like okay nothing was stolen nothing was even destroyed they even shut the door i was like very strange the one thing Micah noted was they uh, they didn't steal the camera. Oh yeah, they didn't. But I don't think I don't think I think they were going so quickly that I don't think they just noticed it. Mm. Maybe. Um. Yeah. So I I don't know. I I dig. Do you have anything more you want to say on this on the subject? I mean, it's it's an interesting phenomenon. Like what I'm wondering about, and I don't know what the answer is to this, or if there even is an answer, if we could even see like a light at the end of the tunnel. But how do we take our cities back? You know, I've always been a big fan of American cities. I've always been into it. You know, it's and the, the issue is that so many, so many. Sorry to interrupt, but the no, no, issue no. is that, that I have to be here is because of my fucking career. You know, and right. Colin had to be in San Francisco because of IGN. You know, I get that. And so many of these big jobs are 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 in big cities, and that yeah. if you want to be thriving in like a mainstream type of way in an industry. Uh, and we're still not totally work from home. Like like that culture shift ha- hasn't really happened. 
um, you you would still need to be if I wanted to work at the New York Times, I would still have to be in New York City, you know. Oh, absolutely. And, that, and, that, and like like the idea of living in New York City is my biggest blocker in me applying to the New York Times. I don't mm-hmm. want to live in that fucking city, you know. So yeah, I, I used to Long fantasize Island, about living there, and I don't exactly. Everyone does, right? Yeah, I I'd, I'd never. I'm I was always now. like, oh, one day I'll end up in Brooklyn, or I, I'll maybe I'll get going to actually end up in Manhattan if I'm you fine. can even afford it. And it's like, I'm oh fine. my god, I can. I'm hoping that we see a day where you know we could return to that. I mean, there's some. I I totally relate to what Gene's saying. I mean, I always knew, especially in entertainment, which is such a minuscule, mm-hmm. specialized industry compared to most things. Like I had to be within commute shot of LA or New York. I always knew that. Yeah. Like, think about how, you know, I, I, even, I know so many animators in LA, you know, you have to be in one of two play. There's this anomaly, maybe in Austin or Chicago or Seattle or Atlanta, but for the most part, 95% of the industry is still subject to those, one of those two places. And only with the advent of the work from home phenomenon, which was ushered in by COVID, right? Has that started to change? Maybe, but you know, but yeah, you have to, it's, it's sad that people don't have the option and I'm a great lover of the suburbs. I'm, I'm a, I'm a mark for the suburbs. I'm a suburb stan. I've always been like, I love the suburbs. I don't see what you guys are making fun of when all the hipsters are like, I need to be in Brooklyn or Fishtown or DC or Austin. I was like, no way, man. Like the, the suburbs are sick. I love it. But you know, not to be able to have the cities where our centers are greatness, man, that's, to me, that's industry, that's the skyscrapers, that's Madison Avenue, all these important, you know, in, all this important infrastructure, like everything we should be proud of as Americans springs from those centers of commerce and culture. It's fucked up that it's going away and it just seems to be dissolving more and more and there's like no end in sight. I will say also that this is all due to the drug crisis, you know, fentanyl, and the opioid, opioid crisis. I mean, look at, you know, like pockets of the big cities. It really does look like the zombie apocalypse, man. You know, it's like hosts of the undead just walking around in a trance, you know. It's, uh, I mean, look at Kensington in Philly, which is a section of North Philly. Mrs. I mean, Kensington. Just, Mrs. Ken- <laughs> Austin, that's Ms. Kensington. Sorry, Austin. Ms. Power Kensington. Kensington. I mean, you see it all over DC retired. too. This is like this is zombie fire people walking around, you know, and, and it's crazy. And they're not stoned, you know. I wish they were, you know. But I mean, that, I guess that's my issue. Like right now, we're looking at drug free zones, and I'm just like, I think a lot of the drug free, the, the drug trafficking happening is just mostly just weed, guys. Um, mm. I, don't know. I also just think it it bothers me because people talk about like we were talking about criminal reform, and it's like this holistic thing that needs to be approached where. I think some people interpret that or even think that I would think if I said I was for that being like, oh, so you believe in kind of like a loosening of criminality in some way, because I think that's what a lot of people think. And I'm like, no, that's not what I think at all. I think we need to reframe what it is to be a criminal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, who is a criminal? Mm -hmm. And the person who's stealing is a criminal. The person who is a drug addict is not a criminal. Mm -hmm. The person who's a drug addict who steals is a criminal. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Right. And yes. I don't. And so we need to be able to go through piece by piece with a scalpel and say, like, this is the way we want to adjust it all the way up to the most cra- capital crimes and most serious things right on down to where we want to draw the line and say, like, this, uh, everything below this is not going to be considered a crime. But we need mm-hmm. to we need to be it's like the the defund the police thing was almost the wrong reaction where the right, in my opinion, the right reaction would be like double down, make sure that everyone that was there is charged make sure that they are all brought to account that there is no leniency and and show that there's going to be a there that will do so much to just tamp a lot of stuff down be like there will be a problem for you like you're not going to just get away with it It, like you you have to at least worry that we're going to come after you and not just be like no that's fine like i'm on camera i'm walking out of target with a thousand dollars worth of merchandise you have my license plate all that and i'm still going to get away with it that's that's what happens right now i will say yeah to your point, Colin, um, if you're done. No, I'm, uh, yeah, go on. Go. Yeah, uh, and then maybe to, to flip the script a little bit uh, and maybe ask you guys, have you guys ever committed a crime before? Um, <laughs> cause I, because I will say, as, as a former uh, person who has been jailed for a misdemeanor, of course, Dewey, as, as Colin says, or driving under the influence, um, I have been caught dr- drinking and driving numerous times. I couldn't even tell you how many times I got pulled over for drinking and driving. But I've only been arrested twice. Now, why is that? 
because all those numerous times I got let go. You know, I, I lived on Guam where I had deep, deep connections to the police. And it's part of the reason why I wanted to leave Guam because I, because I was becoming part of a corrupt system and I really, really didn't like that. Uh, but I would be pulled over by the police and the cops would always know who I was. I was like, oh, it's Gene. It's fine. You know, but I was clearly drunk driving, dude. Like I was swerving, you know, I was fucked up. But then uh, when I got pulled over, they let me go. So I just kept doing it. You know, I was, I was, in fact, I was influential enough that my friends could call me when they got pulled over and I would show up and then my, my friends would be let go. They would be like, you're lucky your friend Gene Park showed up. Otherwise, oh, I would wow. rest your ass. You know? <laughs> we do scenario. Huh? I love it's, it. It's great. It's great. I, I, I love that I lived that life, but I also didn't want to continue living that life. But again, it's because I was never punished for it that I kept drunk driving, right? It wasn't until I finally moved to Hawaii where in, in the Hawaii police, and I know them very well, they were incentivized to go after people who are well-known. Because if you, if you do go after people who are well-known, if you arrest a, a celebrity or a journalist or whatever, you, you, you get extra points for your, for your salary. Good job, you know? So the fact that they got me, that was huge. That was, that was great. And the point is, is you should have never been in that position. But that, like but a, that, system, yeah, a good the, system would have never put the point. You like you should have just arrested me in the first place. Right. And then maybe I would have learned my lesson earlier. Because once I did start, once I did start getting arrested, I was like, maybe I should, maybe I should stop drinking driving. <laughs> this you is know? a little less fun now. Yeah. And I come, yeah, it's way less fun. I'm way, I'm way more paranoid. I know the consequences and, and, and the consequences, the consequences were piling up after the second time I, I lo- I've lost my license and I haven't gotten back in. I'm, I'm still paying the consequences to this day, you know? So, I mean, that's my take on it. And also, I, I will also say my favorite crime that I've ever committed mm-hmm. is theft. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the context. It's, uh, wait, let me, let me look at it. I was in California, and it's the year uh, 2002. Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, just died. <laughs> A legendary businessman, right? An idol in American pop culture. He was so influential that he actually inspired a colonel and he gave advice to the colonel on how to make a chicken place, right? So a legendary man, love the guy, God amongst men. A mensch. Uh, hmm. He died. Yeah, a, tr- a true mensch, I guess, right? <laughs> I, 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 the cultural I appropriation, I would say. So I, so I, I, but, but I know what you mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then me and my buddy, uh, we'll call him uh, Rick. Uh, we were at the Brea, like, the Brea Boulevard Wendy's, and there was a beautiful, beautiful piece of artwork, a painting of Dave Thomas. And it said, Dave Thomas, 1932 to 2002. And we were both high, high off our minds, and we were like, look at that beautiful painting. Look at, <laughs> look at that amazing man. We need this painting in our dorm room. <laughs> so we basically stayed at the Wendy's for like, an hour and a half <laughs> longer than we needed to until there was nobody there except for the staffers. And when we noticed that everybody was back in the kitchen, we just got up and t- just took the painting. <laughs> I love it. That's a victimless crime. We just took the painting and, it, and it. We, we, we just put it in the back of his truck. And then we came back to our fucking college dorm room in Cal, Cal-, Cal-, Cal- State Fulton with this big ass painting of Dave Thomas. And we hung out up in our awesome. living room right yeah, next to the it. huge American flag that we put up after 9-11 happened. Um, <laughs> And then it was, that's what, that was it. This big ass American flag that, that, that was from a decommissioned ship and a big old portrait of Dave Thomas. And I never went back to that Brea Boulevard. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, you couldn't ever show your face there again. I could never. Yeah. Because clearly like our faces were just, were just there. It was a brazen crime, but uh-huh. relatively, relatively hardless. I did go there several years later and they did replace that painting with just a, some generic painting of a, a house and a farm or whatever like that. Oh. It's like, man, like, like yeah, the impact shit. that we left, you know? It's funny, like, I, I, mean, I guess literally speaking, yeah, I've committed many crimes in the sense that I would buy marijuana when it was illegal sure. constantly, yeah. like so many, many, many times. Also, a lot of that was just, and that's where, that's kind of even the delineation of crime, like self-harm versus the harm to others and like, who's the harmer in the situation of a drug dealer versus a person who's drying, buying the drugs and all the rest. But regardless, that was, I guess, it's so funny. I've, I've, I've spoken to this with Micah many times because she's native to Massachusetts where I was like, it's, it was the exact opposite when I lived there. It was dead ass serious to smoke marijuana in, in Massachusetts when I when I was doing yeah. it. You couldn't even buy beer and liquor on Sundays in, in Massachusetts. I don't know if that's mm. still true. And uh, no, they got rid of that eventually. Yeah, like, like they, it, they called it the Puritan laws, I think. And there, it was mandatory minimum sentences for any possession in Massachusetts when, when mm. we were smoking it. So, but I, we kind of didn't 
care and we got obviously got away with it. It wasn't a big deal. No, no one was doing anything really crazy anyway, but that, that would be what I would think. But the other thing that I want, I have to point this out. This is the exact, this is the exact opposite of a real crime is, is, um, Growing up in New York and Long Island and then being in New York City and Boston as well, there's a great tradition of jaywalking in these cities. No one gives a course, shit. Yes. It's not a big deal. Yeah. And it was it's almost unthinkable. Like you, you oh, you just cut across the street. It's free. No, you're it's not expected. doing anything wrong. Like no one gives a shit. When you go to California, yeah. mm-hmm. it's way different. And That's people are like, whoa, what are you? And like people get ticketed for jaywalking all it's the same time. Same in Hawaii too. It's yeah. the same in Hawaii oh, too. Wow. You get fucking and, ticketed. And like they got, they got cameras for fucking jaywalking. Right. People you know? don't people for some reason don't do it. And I guess the other way I would commit crimes is I was always jaywalking in San Francisco and always <laughs> jaywalking in L.A. And and I was often by far the only one where, you know, like people would stack up at a at a at a crossing waiting for the light. There'd be 10, 10 deep or whatever. And I would just like mm-hmm. walk right around them and just walk diagonally. You know, like mm-hmm. not even across the side, like where you just. What is that just, guy doing? It's crazy. It's just, you just have to look. It, it, I've seen people get tickets, and I've done it. Where I've, I've got, I got warned once when I was an intern actually at IGN, which is how I even discovered that it was a thing. Where I was like, "What? Jaywalking? Like I thought that that was like a joke. Like I never even knew that that was a real. <laughs> so that's, I guess, the other way I used to commit crimes in California all the time was just the forever jaywalking in a place where people just didn't do it. It was so funny. I, it's such a cultural thing. You know, very different from New York. Um. Mike, I also you, used oh. to hang out with, uh, and you might not be surprised, but I used to hang out with uh, Korean mafia, um, oh. the the the, the Korean criminal element, um, which is why the Yakuza games are, uh, are 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 so near and dear to my heart because they replicate that experience so so, so deeply and accurately. Um, what's the Korean? That, that what's was the Korean mafia called? Very long. Uh, Korean mafia guys are fucking assholes. I will say that. Much. What is it? What is it called? Like, what is the, no, the yeah, name? Gu- Gu- Guangzhou is is, is is basically it's, it's basically Korean mafia. Like, like it's a, the Guangzhou basically means mafia. You know. Okay. So, like, yeah, there's no specialized term like yakuza, or, you know, or anything like that. It's just it's just Korean mafia. Do they like smu- Do they like smuggling operations out of North Korea and stuff like and, and charge people mega amounts of money? It's mostly gambling, gambling and, and sex work. Um, mm-hmm. the, and that that was that was like my world. Um, because I used to I used to date a hostess hostess bar owner. Um, and then, so she was involved with, with, with that and she kind of brought me in. And then, so when I actually moved to Hawaii, uh, I, ha- I had some contacts there where, uh, they were running an underground gambling ring, uh, underground, uh, you know, like black jerk tables and everything like that. And they actually asked me to, to join in and, and, and be a, a co-owner of the whole operation. And I was like, you know, I, I just moved here. I, I kind of want to kind of, kind of, kind of want to try being a journalist first. Keep it legal <laughs> for a while. Also, yeah, I, I want to be a writer. We're yeah. talking about the spectrum of criminality too. Gambling, yeah. illegal gambling. Yeah. Who cares? Exactly. I, I never, so that's I never why I was like, whatever. Like, maybe I could do that. It's. I just <laughs> never understood. I. I was talking weeks ago about the the movie Boiler Room, which I love, and that yeah. a lot of that is about an illegal like small casino being run out of an apartment, literally. And it's like, who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Why is this a problem compared to all the other things that that are going on? It just doesn't make any sense. They only yeah. care because they're not getting their cut. Right. That's exactly it. That's yeah. exactly it, and that, that's the only reason why jaywalking is being fucking ticketed, is because the, the local city needs those fucking funds. You know, you need to charge a hundred dollars a person just to for walking across the street. A lot of it has to do with money. I never got ticketed. I always had that eagle eye. I was wondering about that. No, I never got a ticket. I did. Like I said, I got warned, and that's how I even discovered that it's like, no, you don't jaywalk here, and you really do realize that people do not jaywalk. No, on in San Francisco and in L- and, and in Los LA, and in Los Angeles, they just really don't do it. But I did. No. Um, Gene, I yeah. have a fast food related crime as well. I was thinking, what did I do wrong besides being apprehended for skateboarding dozens of times? Never arrested. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you, like, like, so, so you must have been breaking and entering into schools all the time, right? Schoolyards, especially in LA. Exactly, yeah. DC was bad. Freedom Plaza in DC was maybe the worst bust. Mm. Like, it was like the cops are going to show up imminently. Like, you roll through once, they showed up. Mm-hmm. Love Park in Philly. Love Park in Philly. Anywhere yeah, in Manhattan. Yeah, iconic place. Was bad. Yeah. yeah. But I never, never got arrested. We got lucky by the grace of God. But we did have one time in high school, Colin knows this story, night, and it was a night mission, went into a McDonald's playland, the outdoor playground with pillowcases, six of us, filled up the pillowcases with the phone, you know, the balls, the, 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 the like I guess, plastic, plastic hollow balls. Yeah. The plastic balls that were in the okay. ball pit filled my, the back of my little hatchback with them. So you could only get in and out of my car through the front seats and then hop in the back if you're going to. And then my entire car was a ball pit <laughs> that for 
a year and a half. I feel I feel like that beats my Dave Thomas story. <laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> Is there any pictures of that? There, uh, there must be. Yeah. We have to have either pictures or like video, you know, video of it some somewhere. You know, that was our that was our claim to fame. Yeah, yeah. But I think about the victims of our crimes. You know, Wendy's and you know, I guess the Playland and McDonald's. You know, I didn't think about it. Really, <laughs> Those really poor victimless. children. It's a victimless crime. Yeah. No, I, I, also stole I always an, I also stole a Nintendo sixty four once from from Kmart. Oh. Did you really? Wow. Yeah. That was fun because it, this was when, when it, you had the little beepers beep, 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 right? Mm-hmm. As you're walking through. And then so me and my buddy would make it so like I would walk through with a, 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 an item in my pocket that I, I was going to that I would say I was going to pay for. And I was like, oh, I forgot. And then my buddy will walk through with a cart with cart with a cart full of uh, two Nintendo 64s. And it would beep at the same time as we both walk through. And I'll be like, oh, sorry, I, 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 I'll pay for this. It's fine. I'll, I'll pay for this. Let me go back. And, and my so you're the out, diversion. Yeah. yeah, I'm the diversion and my buddy's out in the parking lot already stuffing it. And wow. Into the, into the, into That's the hardcore. Stuff. Yeah. I, uh, I don't, th- I, I never saw. We were, we were afraid of being caught. That's the difference between then and now, right? Oh, yeah. And you know, you wouldn't even have to have a diversion. You could just walk out with them now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just be like, I'm just going to leave with these. And then the security guard will be the one videotaping you. you yeah, know? exactly. But uh, I, I do. This is so funny. I, I've brought this up a long time ago in the past is that the only thing I ever stole was <laughs> in finest, which was a supermarket chain on Long Island mm. that became Edwards and then became Stop and Shop or whatever. I think I there used to have like the little a la carte sort of like candy things out where you can like weigh your candy. And I stole one of those and <sighs> I felt bad about it. I didn't like candy. I just did it to, like, to, to feel the thrill. You were and I yeah, and I felt bad about it immediately. Like I was probably, I was with mom. She was, so it was probably, I was probably five, six, seven, something like that. And then I was just, I was always very cognizant of not wanting to be in trouble and I, and like get in trouble. And for no reason, like I wasn't doing anything wrong. I noted when I watched Oz, which was so tragic for me, like traumatizing for me as a kid, all it did to me was say like, Colin, you for under no circumstances, can you go to prison? Like like, there's just no (laughs) way that you can go to prison. You you. know what would happen? Yeah. What, what? You would end up being the bell of the ball. <laughs> That's right. That's true. Hundred percent. That's one of my favorites. She said the like, thing. Yeah. Yes. Say the line, Say Bart. It. Um, Say the, the line, the Micah. Ball. Micah, did you, have you ever committed crimes? So, I mean, I've told the story of the shark in the mailbox before. I guess that's the worst crime I ever committed. We didn't know it was a crime, though. We thought it was just a funny prank. We had no idea that mailboxes were sacred, you know? So, like, when we put that dead shark in the guy's mailbox. It's a federal crime. We had no idea. And I didn't know, like, it was literally years later I told that story. And someone was like, that's a serious crime. And I was like, is it? Like, like it really was like a jazz music stops moment. Like, oh, (laughs) Oh, all right. I, I guess I shouldn't have done that. But, it, you know, we, we never even heard about it. Cause I actually remember being very paranoid about it later. And I was checking the police reports every single day in the newspaper. It was never mentioned. So I said, maybe they just didn't mind. You know, <laughs> I don't know. But, but they didn't care. Um, the only other thing that comes to mind is I accidentally stole a pair of nail clippers one time. And what happened was I went to Walgreens and I I didn't get a basket because I was only going to get one thing, right? And I'm going through Walgreens and I end up just picking up too many things. And I picked up a pair of nail clippers and I had them like just in my hand, but I ended up having to like ball my hand into a fist to hold everything. So I go through checkout and the thing is that I'd been holding the nail clippers so long, I just forgot they were in my hand. It really was just this mental disconnect of like my hand was shut. I didn't know why and I didn't think about it. And I exit the store and and then I opened my hand and I had the nail clippers. And I remember feeling like, oh, my God, I stole. And I like just went back inside and I said to the girl, oh, these weren't on the receipt. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. And I just paid for them. And then I went about my business. <laughs> but like that small crime, I remember feeling like I stole. They're going to get me. I'm like, I, like the, their cops are coming right now. Like I just like immediately felt so sick about it. I was like, oh, my God. So, no, I really haven't committed many crimes. Uh, I don't really have the the stomach for it. It's just that immediate guilt sets in. Like I, I even felt bad like. I downloaded the last season of Naruto and I, the whole time I'm watching it and I'm like, this is not the Shinobi way. I shouldn't have be, I shouldn't be watching this illegally. Naruto wouldn't want that, but it's their fault for not releasing it on Blu-ray. All right. You think I'm going to pay 60 bucks a pop for a DVD? I don't yeah, think so. Yeah. I don't think so. But no, I, I really, 
I haven't lived much of a life of crime, I'm happy to say. Uh, mostly just because I'm a real weenie about it. So I, I would just probably immediately turn myself. And I always say that if I could get away with a crime, like absolutely scot-free, I'd probably like like kill a man or something. But like only if like you have to like promise oh I won't God. get caught. <laughs> wow. Like like if I was like 80 years old and I'm on my way out and they were like I was like absolutely like you're gonna get away with this, like you might just for the love take of somebody out. just for the love of it or like just to feel the, what it is. To, to feel it. I mean, imagine the type of stuff you could write just, after that experience. But, you know, just wow. That's um, <laughs> icicles. That's pretty dark. Just this cold. The, down I mean, and I'm days. talking though, like they. You have to promise I'd get away with it. I'm not taking any risks. All right. Like only if I knew I'd never get caught. Yeah, and then of course I, there's I'd no probably knowing. turn myself in. I probably wouldn't be able to live with it. But I get kind of it's that curiosity. You yeah. know, like to hunt the greatest game, which is like a oh, man. You know, like what what is that like? <laughs> Oh my God! We got Micah the Hunter, Craven the Hunter. Here. I know. It's, she just wants to. She just wants to taste the blood. She wants to know it. Jesus, it's all about the thrill of the hunt. Oh my this God! This is about the curi- the curiosity. <laughs> I did not realize I'd be terrified by the end of this conversation. But. Yeah, seriously. I I don't. I've. <laughs> it's really dark, but it's like I don't really think I have it in me to kill. Like I don't think I could just kill someone. I don't think I could do that. It would be very no, difficult. I, Life or I death. Mean, I guess if you were to do something like that. But I don't oh, know. Not even. I've been mad enough at somebody to be like, I could kill you right now. I don't but think not that, you. Like, no matter not you, honey. Mm. But oh, yeah, I've I've been real mad just, in my just, in, at times. Just and I've just been like, I, 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 I the violence isn't the problem. It's going to jail. I don't want to go to jail. Yeah, Jesus. You know, that's it's, that's the real. You know, Aaron Hernandez, his whole fuck up was he got too complacent. All right, he had it all. He messed it all wow, up. Wow, you're a sociopath, huh? I had no idea. No, got really no, weird. no. It reminds me again of another Louis C.K. bit where it's like it's a good thing that we have laws against murder because the only thing stopping murder happening is the fact that we're not allowed to murder people. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like so if, if we didn't have laws against murder, then it would be weird if you never even murdered somebody before. Oh, yeah. Where, like, I mean, just shows like, oh, I never killed anybody. It's like, oh, you fucking weirdo. What the fuck? Well, yeah. You think of the Wild West and people getting murdered. It's like, you looked at my wife and like, pow, just like, you know, Yosemite <laughs> Sam. I don't, I don't just, think, that, like, I don't think that's enlightened. stepped on my li- shoe. That's bang. Not, that's just, not enlightened living at all. I don't agree with that at all. No, I'm not saying and it's enlightened. People I'm used to shoot each other for card nature. games and everything too, right? So. Well, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I played Red Dead. You know, you if you exactly. cheat at Liar's Dice, and they're like, "You cheated!" Bang, and it's like dead. And that, that's kind of the world that I am curious about. I mean, I just find it very fascinating. What if you cheated at a Liar's Dice in an illegal casino, and then oh, got then, murdered at that casino? Oh, well, then yeah, that's perfectly fair game. I mean, you shouldn't have been there. You know, the casino. If you're at an illegal casino and the owners murder you, I think that's part of what you're getting yourself into. Mm. Well, are we satisfied with the conversation? Gene? <laughs> yes, it, it, it definitely covered a lot more than even I expected. Yeah, that, that was fun. <laughs> All right, I have a final p- passing co- uh, inquiry for you guys. I'm just curious where you, where you stand. This seems to be an evolving question for a lot of people, but I just want to know where, where everyone is on Elon Musk right now, the famous, <laughs> world famous billionaire, uh, mogul, business mogul. I have to say, I kind of envy him in a way, or admi- I don't want to say envy, I admire him. I admire him. I think that I don't agree with everything he says or does. I think he's totally, uh, he, oh, he reminds me of Trump in the sense that like you're so unnecessarily a loose cannon, you don't need to be like this to do what you mm-hmm. need to do. Like you could get so much more by being just a little different and you don't care, or you don't realize it. And I think that that's, that's Trump's big problem. Like if Trump could just change 20%, he would probably be a much more popular person. And Elon Musk is the same way. If you could just kind of temper yourself a little bit and just be a little more normal. But I think eventually you get fuck you money. And I mean, beyond fuck you money and things just don't matter to you anymore. But the reason that I admire him personally is that I think that it's interesting to watch someone really put their money where their mouth is and try to do things. And I don't think that I think the reason that I've admired that is because I I don't think that I would have that same energy or that same drive. I think that after my first billion, I'd probably be like, I'm good. And I'm going to go like do something now. I'm not, but to stay engaged, to risk it, to risk the money and to put it down and double down and do big things, I think is a very interesting thing that I want to see more of. And in fact, from, you know, we have a lot of complacent billionaires and people just sucking money up and not really even trying to do anything. And you kind of have to admire that someone's like, okay, well, 
it's not just Amazon or all of these other companies, but things trying to push the boundaries with SpaceX or try to do different things, you know, an American, new American car company, something that's almost impossible to do with Tesla. And they, they did that as well. And, but I also feel like he has this persona that um, is really grating to a lot of people. And I, and I totally understand that. I also find it a little grating. But the one thing that I wanted to say that I think I appreciate the most is actually what he's done with Twitter in the sense he's kind of ruined it for what and we've we've talked about that and kind of done the soliloquy on it in terms of losing what it once was and the power that it once was. But in some sense, and it's it's actually kind of less for me as a user than it used to be. But he's made it into such a powerful, a potentially powerful entity by divorcing it from the power structures and from the economic structures that hold up other companies and other of their rivals to the point where it could be this bright spot of just unfettered information access that has nothing to do with anything other than just that vacuum of that place itself that people were circulating being like, Oh, Disney's not everyone's stop. It's like, who cares? I mean, it's, it sucks for them, but that who, why do we give a shit about that? We, why do we want to be, why do I want to be advertised to by these mega corporations? So I kind of appreciate that he's doing what he does and I'm not a stand by any stretch of the imagination, but I think he, I think people act a little silly when they act like what he he does doesn't matter or that it's too loose or that he's not a contributor. And I think he says definitively true things that I, I, I would put forth to anyone. One thing he says that I find really interesting, he's like, no one has paid more in taxes than me ever in, the, in American history. Like he pays the most taxes. And that's true. And the second thing that he said that I thought that I thought was interesting, and he said this more recently, was that no individual has done more for the environment and for Earth and for the future of Earth than him. And I agree with that too. As far as just literal companies trying to get to Mars, literal companies revolutionizing green energy. And I think that that dichotomy of having this real resume of of intriguing contributions and then this really unlikable personality is what makes it really hard for people to marry the reality of those two things which is that in my opinion you have like a a, a world class genius on your hands that you want to be able to not exploit i don't want to say that but like let him kind of do his thing and all that and i, I think that a lot of the the controversy around him and all that stuff is missing the forest for the trees and just that he's fighting the powers that be and it's kind of awesome and i wish people would just step back and be like oh like well who do you want to win the government or like some fucking huge company or some dude that's just a renegade who says like we're gonna go to mars and we're gonna do we have this social media company where it's all about just unfettered or as unfettered as possible free speech and all that i think it's interesting so i wanted to know where on the spectrum of elon musk love or hate you guys stand right now and i again i know that this answer for everyone changes so i think that at least in my experience it does it does for me too so i wanted to say that that like we're kind of saying this in the now and the here and maybe we'll approach it again in the future and maybe we'll all feel very differently but um gene i wanted to go to you first where where are you on elon musk i am uh for elon musk i don't like him right uh, i'm definitely not a fan of him i i don't I, I am exhausted by feeling tired of him or I'm exhausted by everyone being mad at him. Cause it, especially because if you spend a lot of time on Twitter, that's all you get, you know, it's all fucking people talk about. Um, and it makes sense because he is uh, the emperor and overseer of, of that website now. Um, so I guess my opinion is uh, mostly, and I think a lot of the, the, the recent social media opinion is because of how he's run Twitter, which is not, I don't think he's, he's running well. Um, and it's only because, well, I mean, like, just look at the name change itself. Look, look at how many times, even the app itself is calling itself X, formerly known as Twitter. It can't get away from the, from the former branding. So from a branding perspective, it was idiotic, right? Oh. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know enough about how, what Elon Musk has done in, in business uh, to, to properly assess uh, how smart I think he might be. Uh, but what I do know is that he's not very smart at running a social media company. Um, and that's a completely different beast than anything he's ever done. And it's, 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 it's not easy to run. Right. Um, I, to your point about advertising, I don't, I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit if Disney or whoever advertises on Twitter. It, it doesn't matter to me. Um, 
and it, I, th- I absolutely agree that he gets in, he gets in the way of himself, and he is his own worst enemy. He didn't need to call that submarine guy or whatever a pedophile. Oh right, I know that was crazy. Years, yeah. All those years ago. Now, I understand where he comes from in, in his line of thinking, right? Um, I also know a guy who would always go to Thailand who was about that age, you know, and I know what the fuck he was going to Thailand for. There, 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 there was no business reason why he was going to Thailand. Uh, he went to Thailand because he was a pedophile, you know, and uh, I've watched, <laughs> I, I know enough pedophiles. Or I've seen enough pedophiles to know you, you can look at, you can, you can see it in their fucking eyes, man, you know? And so I was like, so I, I, he never said, he never told anyone that he was going to Thailand for that. We got to start a predator hunter operation. No, <laughs> no, you don't have time for that. Yeah. Your schedule's full. You can't be out catching predators. <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is that a lot of these folks have a hard time too. Like dads against predators hasn't uploaded anything for a long time. It's like, Jesus Christ. Well, you got, well, I mean, they're out there fucking punching guys now. So I don't know. Dude, the one, the one I was saying the, the, on the show, I was talking about how one of them took the guy's keys and just threw them on top of the building. Of the That's the guy who got yeah. shot. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like another video, shot and yeah. died, you yeah. know? Yeah. Boop, yeah. Boop, yeah. Shakur. Right, exactly. Yeah, the guy who, the, the predator catcher that did that got shot by some guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because he was so aggressive that he would do things like break their fucking windows, kick their cars, and like throw the keys on the top of the thing. So that's why, so I know why Elon, so I know the mentality of why Elon Musk would think that a guy who goes to Thailand all the time is a pedophile. I get that. The difference between me and Elon is that I'm smart enough to know not to accuse a guy who who I don't know. Not, not ne- never mind that he was trying to rescue people, but I don't even know him, or I've never even seen his eyes. And then to say that he's a pedophile and to say that out loud, uh, that to me is like 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 emblematic of his problem. That like he does have worm brains like we do, but then he has no filter. I guess probably because of, of fuck you money. Um, sure. And I think you're right in that Trump and Elon are very similar in that. Trump became the most powerful human being on, on the planet. And Elon is also probably the most powerful human being on the planet. And also definitely the richest human being that has, has, that has ever existed in the history of hu- humankind. What does that do to your brain if you're already egotistical, right? Yeah. And he definitely um, is. I mean, he definitely does. He does have an ego. But I feel like you can't say things like i think it was in the i haven't read it yet but i've, I've read excerpts of the walterson i a walter isaacson biography of him which is supposed to be really good and they say people say apparently in, in the book like many times he he's dead ass serious about what he says he's gonna do like when when he's like we're going to mars he dead he means it like he knows mm-hmm. in his mind in and at least in his concept of the reality he's like he he himself is going to mars mm-hmm. and not coming back right like that kind of situation and it's so interesting to just deal with someone that serious and then see kind of the results of that mindset like a rocket that can be reused for mm-hmm. instance it's like mm-hmm. what and these guys are the one of the only reasons along with some russian companies and other private companies like blue origin i guess are going to get involved in whatever Bezos Actually, obviously yeah getting too. getting yeah. everything even into space at all mm-hmm. and you I, I look at that and i'm like that's that's real results. And what so it actually bums me out when, when things explode or when the experiments go awry and whatever. And I'm like, why do you want them to fail? It's so weird. It doesn't make well, it doesn't make any sense. Funny. They're the closest to answering the question. Like they're the closest to getting it. And these experiments are valuable to them, even if they fail. I know, but it's like we should want them to. It's a private company. They're not asking mm-hmm. anyone for anything, you know, like mm-hmm. NASA gives them a little bit of money and we give NASA a fraction of our taxes. But to me, it's just, it, I don't know. Yeah, Micah, go ahead. You, you take it away. Oh, no. Okay. Well, it's you were gonna funny say when a rocket, no, it's funny when a rocket explodes. It's funny when a Tesla catches fire on the highway randomly, so long as no one's hurt. All right. I already got called a sociopath once. I'm not mean, I don't want anybody to get hurt, but when a Tesla just randomly you, you bursts in the flames. You already confessed to murder someone earlier, like just, not even 10 minutes ago. So. Okay, wait, 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 check here, guys. You're telling me that if you could get away with it, you wouldn't kill a guy. You're telling me dead serious that if you could me. get away with it, you would, but you'll get away with it. I swear, like I, I, that's genie not my wish problem. level, you'll get away with that's it. Not my you wouldn't problem. kill someone. It, it's, I mean, that would be a problem too, but I just wouldn't be able to do it because I don't think I have it in me. And if I was in a war situation or something, maybe I would, I would do it. You know, or like protecting myself. I don't know if I could do it, but I wouldn't mind if someone died. Right? <laughs> well, I don't true. know if I could. 
I would. I even on you if there's you were one on person fire. I'm thinking about that I definitely hate, and I'm uh, and and that is the one person I'm thinking. Whereas I could I or could I not kill him? Right. Mm -hmm. No, I know who I'd spend it on. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. You know that if I was going to kill one person, it would be that person. But I don't know if 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 I (laughs) if if I even hate them enough to do that. You know, that's so interesting. Yeah, I, 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 there are people (laughs) I know in life where it's like if they were on fire, I wouldn't piss on them. Yeah, and that's about as close as I would get to, like totally the Schadenfreude of their downfall. I would, I all of that's right in in my wheelhouse. But me throwing it and everything. Yeah. yeah, me acti- me actively participating in any way. I don't No, not for me. Well, all right. Well, if as so long as I'm the only one then who's going to murder somebody if they get the chance. We're, we're just I won't have an alibi now cuz I won't be like, see, they also said it. <laughs> they also said they'd kill a guy. No, so the thing with Elon Musk. <laughs> I, I don't give a shit about Elon Musk. He's just a man and I don't know him and I don't care about him. It, I'm my whole thing is I'm just annoyed by both sides, the people who are extremely passionate about Elon Musk and the people that hate him. And I'm like, why don't y'all just go shut up? Because I don't, you know, it's like the guy. The stands owns are a annoying car. too. The stands are very annoying That's the thing. Too. It's oh, like definitely. the guy owns a car company and a rocket company. And it's like, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't like electric cars. I fucking hate outer space. You know what? I like it when the rocket explodes because you shouldn't be out there. Mm. You got to leave it alone. <laughs> Leave outer space alone. All right. You shouldn't be out there. If your rocket explodes, oh, they were coming back and they got into the atmosphere and everybody died. And it's like, well, you weren't supposed to be there, were you? You know, they get you're supposed to be here on this planet. You ain't supposed to be out there. So I don't I don't like outer space. I don't like electric cars. I don't hate it. And that's the other thing. People take it as a political statement one way or the other. And it's like, no, man, electric cars don't tickle your wiener the same way as a real engine does. Okay. It's just different. It's just different. And I don't want one. And I don't like the way the batteries randomly explode. That scares me. So I just, I'm just going to stick with what I know, which is a hatchback. You know, it's fine. But I just, it's, I'm just annoyed by the fact that he's such a big deal. You can't say anything about Tesla without someone saying Elon Musk sucks. And it's like, this dude's just talking about his dumbass car, okay? I mean, just let mm. the guy talk about his car. You can't say anything about the Mars project without someone bashing it. It's like, I don't know, man. Like, if people like science, let them talk about it. It's like, the problem with Elon Musk is that, yeah, his unlikability taints everything he touches. So you can't talk about anything in a positive way. And then if you say it in a negative way, people are like, you're just jealous because he's a billionaire. And it's like, you you can't criticize the man one way or the other because like you just come off as crazy. I do think the, the, the cyber truck uh, backlash or whatever is pointless because like why is there a backlash to a truck that's really really hard? You know. I right. mean, the dumb thing is just that it's ugly. <laughs> yeah, and, like, it looks stupid. Like, yeah, sure. It looks yeah. fucking stupid. Yeah, that's my problem how with stupid it. it looks. Yeah, like the fact that it's arrow proof or whatever. That's pretty sweet. I like All that. Right. I, the, Take it I, on I like the fact that, that, that is like that, that is bulletproof and everything like that. That's interesting to me because yeah. you know, as you guys know, I enjoy luxury items, right? No, like, like, look at how stupid it is for me to have flip flops that cost a thousand dollars, right? Gene, do you have flip flops that cost a thousand dollars? Yes, I do. Oh my god, Gene! Right? Do they have a thong or are they slides? No, no, they're 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 they're, they're, they're like they're, they're like little thongs. They're, they're, they little come what? come up and everything. Oh everything. They're, 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 they're flip flops. They're, they're they're slippers, but they cost a thousand dollars from Louis Vuitton. But I've been I've had them for over ten years. <laughs> think about the longevity. Uh, think about how many flip flops I haven't bought since. Then. That's some Jay Z so, shit. Yes, obviously you, you can buy flip flops for, for like a dollar or whatever. Yeah, like that, exactly. Right? But like they're comfortable, man. They're so comfortable. They're the most comfortable piece of footwear I've ever I've ever owned. The most comfortable piece of flip flops ever owned. And I feel like I got my money's worth. So if I if I could buy a, a truck for however much it's call it's costing. And it it can last me that long, and it can just take like take bullets. No, I'm not paranoid. Well, obviously, I live in a city, city, so I'm feeling a little bit more paranoid. But even beyond that, even if I wasn't paranoid, I still would. I, I if I had the money to afford that, and if I like luxury goods, like fuck, it's like the PlayStation Portal of cars, right? Mm. Like it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. You know, like 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 we don't need it, but like it's kind of cool that I spent this money, and now I know that I will never get shot. Isn't that interesting? I mean, yeah, do not you know, wear those outside. I do wear them outside. Oh no, Gene, you're gonna get slipper jacked. <laughs> well, I won't. Now I don't. I don't in DC anymore. I don't do in DC anymore, but I uh, used to. <laughs> and in Hawaii, where everybody everybody had flip flops, like I had the, I had the best ones, you know. 
So, oh, yeah, who has better than that? But I you mean, that, that, be... so I do think that the the backlash against like everything Elon does is like ridiculous and it's so mm. exhausting. It's like for me, I I would just rather tune him out and like ignore him. The, what it what it comes the, the reason why I will focus on the social media part of Elon is because that that is what affects most of my work. Like I miss seeing headlines in Twitter. I, I, like I, I fucking yeah, that was it. weird. Yeah, I fucking hate like not seeing the headlines. Like I, I, I don't sometimes I don't even want to read your fucking tweet. I just want to read the headline and, and what this person is sharing. And then maybe I'll read the tweet afterwards. But like now I have to like read a tweet and I have to click click through and everything like that. So I miss headlines. I miss I, I miss calling a Twitter. Um, you know, uh whatever he's saying about advertisers, it does seem like I like I would want Disney money, you know, like 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 as a consumer, I don't give a shit that Disney's advertising there, but like if I was working on Twitter, I'd be like, Yeah, like if I got Disney as an advertiser, hell yeah, you know. Um, so I do think that it's dumb that he's calling, he's telling Bob Iger or whatever, go fuck yourself. Uh, <laughs> but like, it's it, it must be fun for him because he has fucking money, and like, yeah, so, he, so he he has a bully pulpit as as a cultural icon to be able to do this. Um, but he also seems really, really clearly too concerned about being well liked. You know? Definitely, that's the that's a huge. That is exactly it. Even the way he delivered yeah. that line, because I when telling Bob Iger to go fuck himself, I think is a, mm-hmm. a really interesting thing to do. And I don't think Bob Iger is a necessarily great person either. I'm, I've read a lot about him. He seems like a douchebag, yeah, actually. Too, you know? He's a shit but but yeah. my, what I thought was weird is that the hate for Elon Musk was so strong that people were like, fuck, look at him talking to Bob. Like, how do you say that Bob Iger? Like, what an asshole to say that. It's like, dude, <laughs> fuck Disney. Are you kidding yeah. me? Like, we should all be behind the dude who's and this is why I think it's a powerful and interesting person and why he just that that last 20 percent, he just can't change where it's like, mm-hmm. dude, that, that's good stuff, in my opinion. You're like, yeah, fuck Disney. Fuck the big companies that are going to try to weigh you down and blackmail you basically into into towing the line. I totally it's good stuff. Why can't you just be more normal and do that? But yeah. Yeah. And yeah. well, one thing, too, I, I want to point out before you pass it along is just that people hate him so much, too, that they point out that like, he's a bad father. Like, they'll just dig up anything. And I'm like, who gives a fuck? You probably have a bad father, too. I mean, like, Jesus Christ. Like he's I a have a bad father. Man. Whatever, dude. It's, it's what people, people always bring it up about Steve Jobs. Like, you know, he was a bad father. And it's like, you think I give a fuck? I'm buying the iPhone. The man's dead. You think I care about his daughter? It's just one of those things. I'm like, what is... You're acting like he killed a man mm-hmm. and you're just like, he's a bad dad. Oh, that's not a good thing, obviously. But to be like, you shouldn't go on Twitter. Elon Musk is a bad dad. And it's like, who fucking cares? I don't remember the part where me buying an iPhone means that I endorse Steve Jobs entire life. I don't remember the part where me being on Twitter and posting mm-hmm. my hot lettuce sandwich means that I endorse everything Elon Musk has ever done or said. It's like, I'm just a consumer using a product. I, I completely missed the part where I have to endorse everything this guy says down to him being a good father. Like, that's what do I care? Michael, that's exactly why I pay $8 a month for Twitter. <laughs> because, because because I don't give a shit about who, who owns it or whatever like that. And and part of the reason why I pay for Twitter is because, and to have that blue check is to show people like, look, you, you, you sometimes you just need to separate this shit, man. It's not, it doesn't need to be get that deep, you know? Like you all know that I'm not a huge fan of Elon Musk. Yet I'm gonna pay for Twitter because, you know, it, yes, it's only eight bucks, but I get I get money back. That's re- that's really what it comes down to. That's it. You know, I don't give a shit what Steve Jobs thinks or whatever like that. I don't give a shit that John Lennon used to beat Yoko Ono. I still I still like the Beatles. You know, that's it's oh, fine. People bring that know? up all the time. It's like, dude, like I don't know what you want me to care about this, especially for some dead guy. Mm-hmm. Like it's just to a point of like I'm gonna listen to the CD. I'm gonna use the iPhone. It's like I just. Because it's for things that are so petty. Mm-hmm. It's like you're acting like he committed genocide. But if it makes you like, feel uncomfortable, his, his kids also, don't like him. If it makes you feel uncomfortable, then yeah, you shouldn't do it. You know, like I like like if 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 I, if I bought a Tesla, then, then then I'm gonna hear it all the way from from people who hate Elon Musk, and I I just don't want to buy a Tesla. You know, but. It kind of reminds me of the easy ally situation where it's like, <laughs> you know, like, 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 you, like, you don't need to, it doesn't need to get that deep, man. Like, you know, like I, it, it's it not really some endorsement didn't, of any kind of philosophy or anything like that. Just exactly. Fucking, it uh, really you either didn't. listen to the content or you don't. That's it. Just make that decision. It doesn't need to be this whole dramatic thing. Just, it's just a you decision. Just, just figure it out for yourself and then, and then do that. And right. then, and then we're all happy. That's it. Right. You know, totally. Dig. Let's hear yeah. from you on this topic. I mean, I'll start with this. Elon Musk is the personification of you can't buy 
cool. Yeah. Right. How much more awesome would it be if he just set himself up to be this enigmatic mad scientist up on the mountain somewhere and, and just speak through your actions. You're doing all this innovative mm-hmm. bitch and shit through Tesla and SpaceX and the boring company and all these other bold endeavors. Just <laughs> speak through the shit that you're giving the world and never say a word. How yeah. much cooler is that? He's, and, he's a, exactly. he's a billionaire cornball. Imagine like, if he <laughs> took over Twitter and he was, and, and all, all he did was exactly what Colin likes about it. This is a free speech platform. Yeah. You know, th- 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 this is the marketplace of ideas. And then he just goes away and shuts the fuck up. I love just, that. And, and, and like just, we're gonna just, we're gonna untip the happen, scales yeah. and make it make it even again, like and undo all of the stuff they've done on Twitter and just leave it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. Yeah, just, just shut the fuck up and then leave it at that. And then and then Twitter be fine. Bob Iger will still be fucking advertising. Blah blah blah. You know, like I don't understand. Yeah, speak through your actions. Why he needs to be like be this way? You know, like it's as, pretty as, as, a, as a man child. Anyways, I'm sorry, Dave. Go ahead. I, no, no, not at all. I mean, I think Colin is the one who really kind of introduced me to Elon Musk. I'm not sure how many years ago it was, but when he first got on my radar, you know, you find this very involved, very active, very boots on the ground, corporate billionaire leader of these innovative companies, right? Like I've long admired the things he does with SpaceX and especially Tesla. I mean, the Model S Plaid Tesla is a fucking, I saw, I've, people have them. I mean, I live in a wealthy area. People have them all over the place. That thing launches from a red light and goes to 60 in less than two seconds. It's a fucking rocket ship. It's a beautiful machine. I, I love the internal combustion engine. Give me my German cars all day. Japanese cars, I love them. But I mean, the guy is innovating. You know what I mean? And, you know, I mean, look at this, right? Who does this? The, cre- the level of kind of creativity and the chutzpah, right? LA has a lot of traffic. Oh, really? We're going to fucking tunnel underneath it. It's taking a long time. They're giving the big dig in Boston a run oh, for yeah, their money, no for sure. And that killed but, a person. He he puts his dollars up and he makes he turns his ideas into actions. You know when he won me over? This was year, I'm not sure how, how long ago this was, but when he on top of everything else, he just said screw it and manufactured 500 flamethrowers to 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 sell for shits and giggles. Like that's not only funny, but he's like a breath of fresh air in that way. When you think of like corporate billionaire, multimillionaire, whatever leaders, that punk rock energy that he brings, that FU attitude that he, you know, that he would have shareholders back when Tesla was in its kind of infancy that would gripe about something. And he wouldn't say, you know what, if you don't like it, you're free to leave. He would say, fucking sell your shares back. I don't want you on this board. Who does that? But again, it's that he has. He is the personification also of being able to say fuck you to anybody and everybody with minimal negative impact. Like that kickback, that recoil, he could withstand almost any financial blow. Hence, buy Disney, buy NBC Universal, Comcast, buy Walmart. Like it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like you're witnessing something that very few people will ever be able to do. In the course of history. I mean, I think that being said, here's a man who has the power, as you guys said, and the FU money and the resources and the influence to pretty much do and say whatever he wants or the closest approximation that we will ever see mankind produce, right? But that being said, it's that old adage of with great power comes great responsibility. I think when you wield that much influence and P.S., it's not just him. He employs thousands of people across his companies, right? So I do think it's incumbent upon an Elon Musk to be responsible for his words and actions a little bit. Like it sounds kind of judgmental, but flying off at the mouth or the thumbs or just knowing that you have a much more gigantic soapbox than the average bear doesn't mean you should always be standing on it. You know what I mean? Like freedom of speech all day. Of course, you guys know me, but there's so much more extra attached to everything he does. There's a heightened responsibility because of who he is and what he has and the power he wields. So he has to be careful because he's that much more influential. I feel like, like his words have a lot of weight. He wields a lot of influence. So 
you know, he's got to be careful not to align himself with anti-Semitic shit and all that kind of stuff. For me, like that, that's just, that's who you are. Like you, you're on a world stage. You're higher than, you know, you're right up there with who, who else right now? Taylor Swift, right? Like everybody sees, you know, everybody notices you're on the huge, you're under the huge spotlight, you know? So that, you know, for me that it would be, I don't know. It would just be classier if he was a little, for me, and maybe it's a taste thing, if he was a little less outspoken and a little more thoughtful with, you know, his podcast appearances or his tweets or whatever. And just kind of, again, you can't buy that though. It's case in point. You can't buy class. You can't buy cool. You can't buy the way you conduct yourself, charisma. I don't think he has a lot of that, you know? And I'm not saying, you know, I know like some things money can't buy, but it would just be cooler. It would be a cooler look if he was somebody you could get behind rather than yeah, somebody I mean, you like, just get annoyed by. Remember when he was on Dave Chappelle's <laughs> stage and the only thing he could say was, I'm rich, biatch. Like the most cringy, like obvious joke that you can make like there. Um, and he just like takes it and he just does it, you know? And like it's, he's he's got like the sense of humor of like, a 13 year old in 2012, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. He seems no, not even like a 13 year old today, you know? Yeah, no, totally. He seems, he seems, I don't know yet. Yeah, it's not even socially unaware. I guess it, it, you said it Gene earlier. It's like, what, what does it do to your brain when you have, it's not even like there's rich and then there is that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I'm sure that that does break you in some serious ways that can't be repaired. I, I wonder mm-hmm. if he would do something for his reputation. If he, did try to kind of go away. But I also think it's very, again, kind of analog to Trump. It's interesting how well Tesla, for instance, does considering how many people don't like Elon Musk. Some people probably just write that off and don't care. And then it's interesting in the sense that the people that find him most unsavory seem to be more of like the granola, crunchy left types who would be right. Tesla's major customers because these are an a- that's a pretty affluent group of people that want to have a green vehicle or whatever. So he's not even reaching them and still no. doing these things. But- to me, I consider him kind of a, a mark of resistance against against really generational organizations that have a lot of power. And I want him to fuck some of these companies up for sure, or at least like expose some of them. So you think about Tesla versus like the the, the big American car companies. It's like, why wouldn't you want to, like a, a new competitor to kind of break into that? And he's the epitome of disruptive. Right. And uh, I agree. He's and a maverick, a real maverick. And the same thing with uh, SpaceX. With It's like, dude, his competitors in that realm are like Boeing and Raytheon. And stuff. It's like, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing? These companies are fucking, these companies suck. You know, they, they just, they s- suck the blood literally of these, of, of just all of our money up and just make these, ma- and, we, and we have this guy who's like, just wants to make rockets. They're not even making weapons or doing these. They don't have black ops and fucking skunk work <laughs> projects and all this crazy shit just siphoning money away from the government it's like i want them and the same thing with entertainment companies a good example is uh that the um uh, and i don't really i don't really care for him very much but uh the daily wire and mm. ben shapiro and i'm not a crazy fan of ben shapiro but i really respect that the daily wire and i'm not a reader really i, I don't really listen to any of their stuff to be honest is I respect that they're like, we're going to try to do something truly counterculture and make something like make things. And they just did that. They did another feature length film called mm. that, that movie Lady Ballers or whatever. That's kind of like wow. an anti trans sports thing. And it's like, cool. People make fun of that kind of them doing that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I, I just respect people putting their money where their mouth is and saying, like, we are going to try to make a we're not going to bitch about there being no solution. We'll at least try to make there be a solution and then we'll see what happens and the, mm-hmm. the market will speak. But people fighting against the powers that be, I think are it's always good. It's always, that's always good in all spaces is like the, the entrenched power should always be challenged. And so to have it happen in that way, I think we should champion it more until he himself becomes the entrenched power and needs to be challenged. And that I don't think we're mm-hmm. in much danger of, in my opinion, because I feel like a lot of his value, like his net worth, He's always going to be a a vastly rich billionaire, but a lot of his fluctuating net worth comes from the value of these various companies. And so he goes and rises and falls with that. But that's not liquid money. He doesn't have the like when people he was asked during that that seminar or whatever, where he gave that Q&A 
and said, bot, told Bob Iger, go, Iger to go fuck himself where they're like, you have the amount of money to just keep Twitter going forever, basically. And it's like, that's kind of, he didn't really answer, but I'm like, that's as far as I understand, kind of a misreading as to where his wealth really is. I don't think it's like liquid asset. That's true. Well, that's true. You know? Yeah. So a lot of people, you know, the Washington Post were about a, to, to, to buy out a bunch of folks, right? And, and lay off folks. And then so a lot of folks were like, well, why doesn't Bezos blah, blah, blah. And, then, you know, and to be fair, Bezos did just buy a $68 million mansion in, in Miami. So I get that, right? But really the nature of business is that you can't just keep funding something that's losing money forever, right. you know? Right. Um, and and that doesn't, that, that's not good. That's not, that's not good business. That's just not how you, you do business. Well, then because it, it becomes questionable, this is the big problem with sites like the Federalist and um, uh, the Intercept <laughs> is that they're funded either shadow, kind of a, by shadowy figures at a loss or like with the Intercept, it's like that rich, it's like a, one of that rich billionaire guy. That Pure fund, media, my former boss. Right, exactly. And, and peop, so then people become suspicious of like, why are you even doing this? Mm-hmm. Is it to like have a point of view that seems established, but you're kind of buying it like in an oligarchical sort of fashion, which is mm-hmm. why I, I agree with you. Like Jeff Bezos's job is not to make the Washington Post run. Mm-hmm. It's to like he bought it. And I remember him buying it. I remember it was kind of a steal. Right? Wasn't it like <laughs> it's a super steal? Like, yeah, it's ridiculous. Wasn't it like three hundred million dollars or something like that? Like something Two, less than that, bro. Two hundred fifty million dollars. Yeah, that's dude. like wow. I can't even believe that. That's like that's insanity. Not, not even, it's not even anything. We're worth more than that now, at least. I would like, imagine. Good thing, I would imagine yeah. the post would go for over a billion. It's over a billion now, yeah. at least. So yeah. So but, yeah, I don't. So the, so, value, the valuation has gone up since that, but that's how fucking like <laughs> like shitty it was. It was for a steal. Yeah, it was for a penny. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's all no, it's all good. I just wanted to say, like, I I want uh, so I, I I want centers of power to continuously be challenged, even if the the challenges go or are unremarkable to, to to who you're targeting at. So, for instance, like we always say, like we always want to be hard on Sony on sacred symbols because they're like the the arbiter. It's like you got to kind of keep them honest. You don't want to like trust them or believe them or yeah. be lackadaisical. And they're a corporation. It's not a person. You're not injuring anyone. It's the market speaking. And I think that, yeah. So anyway, I, I, I just love that there's a guy and a series of companies that are challenging established power brokers that are maybe not the best of what they do anymore, or maybe should be challenged, or maybe just have way too much power. And we need to transfer that over to some other companies and other people, and then ultimately tra- continue that transference over time. So yeah, I just wanted to check in with you guys about that. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. There was uh, a recent story by uh, my friend Ronan Farrow, who was uh, one of the, the the premier reporters of the Me Too, uh, particularly the Harvard Weinstein story. Right. right? Yeah. What's the prize winning? This uh, is Mia Farrow's he, son, right? Mia Farrow's son and Frank right. Sinatra's oh, son. Oh, wow. Right, you know? uh, old blue eyes. He's got, he's got the same blue eyes. And noted gamer, huge gamer, huge gamer nerd. We're actually friends on, on Nintendo Switch. Oh, awesome. Yeah, we, oh, we actually cool. traded friend codes. So he's like my literal Nintendo Switch friend. But he did a story about how Elon Musk is, is often uh, um, asked for advice from the Department of Defense, Defense and the Pentagon. So Elon's becoming entrenched too. Uh, he, wow. he, he's, 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 he's working his way into the centers of power too. But I mean, that's, that's what these billionaires do. They're, 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 you know, it's no coincidence that Bezos wanted the, New York, the, the Washington Post versus the New York Times. You know, because we're here in the most powerful city in the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, it, it'll be a legacy gift for his children, the Washington Post. You know, that, 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 that's how he looks at it. We're like, we're like a fucking luxury timepiece. We're like a Rolex that he's passing on to his kids, basically. You know, except that it's just a company of a thousand, thousands of people and an institutional <laughs> media organization. But that's, that's how he looks at us. You know, we are, we are, we are, we are a legacy gift for his children. Yeah, it's... uh a totally different level of wealth. And I think we've argued about it in the past. It was one of the first episodes of the show, I think was argue, uh, where I was bringing up, like, should they exist now because we've allowed it, but like, should people even be allowed to accumulate that much wealth? Yeah. And, yeah. and I don't, my, my instinct says no, but I yeah. just don't know how you calibrate that because I do, I do fear the unusual Elon Musk type situation where, it's like you're stymieing someone from truly doing crazy shit because you don't want them to become mega, mega rich, but they're going to become mega, mega rich because they're really good. And you don't want to kind of get in the way of that either. So I don't know how that would all work. Like, Cause there's an argument. It's like, if I know I'm going to, if I, if I know I'm going to tap out at a billion dollars or whatever mm-hmm. of net worth, it's like, well, what, that's kind of weird. And I'm going to prepare for that. 
And I could probably even reach that by only getting five hundred million dollars worth of wealth and then letting that money just work. So you're mm-hmm. just going to I'm just going to remove myself from the economy. But mm-hmm. I'm a very high value person. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the hypothetical person. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that's going to be a, a big thing yeah. to deal with. But yeah, like maybe people shouldn't even be able to become like Elon Musk. Maybe you shouldn't be able to even have a rocket company, a car company and do all these things at one time. But mm-hmm. at the same time, he made smart bets with things like PayPal and um, he was right. he was on board. I mean, that's where he made all of his money. And that's right. He was on board for I a lot of plans. smart things. So, yeah. I will caution against the uh, the the thinking that if you're a billionaire, you got to be you got to be smart. Um, as someone who's known a couple of billionaires, some of them are pretty stupid too. Well, let me ask you um, this though: Do you think I would think that it would be impossible to become a self-made billionaire? Yeah. So you're talking about people that inherited their money, and that I believe inherited the money, or or you had a really really good idea. That really, that, that that really, really took off, and that, and and that's all you got, man. That's all you had is that one really, really good idea, mm. and you're good at nothing else. Could that one walking. good idea is is paying off millions and millions for years. You know, that could happen too. But yeah, yes, I, obviously, also you can inherit. I'm not talking about Jeff Bezos, <laughs> to, to be quite clear. And I actually have been in meetings with Bezos, and and so I know like how he conducts meetings and how he makes decisions. I think he's actually very, very smart. And he's fairly self-made too. No, you know? he totally is. And that's the point I, I think, I mean, there may be, well, there are certainly, we already know will be exceptions to the rule, but I can imagine that a billionaire receiving his money from a trust or whatever could be very mm-hmm. stupid. It would be hard yeah. for me to believe that even someone who was somewhat privileged like Elon Musk or very privileged like Trump turning mm-hmm. millions into billions, I still think that that's an incredible level of skill in, so, in some mm-hmm. sense, you know, and that you can't, you can't really fall into something like that. I don't, I don't think, I think, it, I don't think that would only go to so far so that when Elon, one of Elon Musk's many mysterious children are the benefactors when he dies of all of his wealth, then those are the ones where we'll be like, well, you didn't necessarily earn this and now you have to with, you know, hold it, I guess, or do whatever you will with it. And then we'll see if your theory is right or not, but I think you're probably right. Um, all right, we'll leave it there. We've been going for a long time. Let's go around the horn and say goodbye to everyone. Gene, Thank you for your time today. It's good to see you. It's a, we're recording this on a Saturday, so we're all caught up for the holiday. So I, t- I appreciate you taking the time on the weekend to talk to us. Yeah, love to be all up in LSM's guts. Yeah, get up in here, balls again, deep. You know? Yeah, <laughs> get all balls the, the, deep the, in the, this. H- hilt deep. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love it. Again, this was a fun episode. Oh, uh, good. Uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you thought so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really fun. Uh, it was fun to be with the family, the Moriarty family, you know, and uh, Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. You know, I love Constellation. This is my favorite. It's my favorite program on the last and last Ooh, Media network. So. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you. We'll have you back on soon, of course. And Dave, let's go to you. Uh, say goodbye to you. Have a good rest of your weekend. Gene, you have exquisite taste, my friend. But you always knew that. Mm-hmm. You always knew that. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you guys so much. And uh, yeah, last one for the year for 2023. We're out. See you in January. Yeah, this, this is, last is, this is the last deli for the year. No. No, okay. <laughs> no, no, it's oh, not. I thought we it have was. one more to do. This is the last holiday episode to record. We have one more that we have to do. Mm. Oh, one more regular one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm. Sorry. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> well, we'll keep that for the next time then. Mikey, goodbye to you. Goodbye. I don't believe you guys that you wouldn't actually kill a person given the opportunity. <laughs> but, you know, I'm going to, I'll take one for the team here. I'll be the sociopath, yeah, yeah. but I don't buy it. I don't buy yeah. it. Not for a second. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Well, thank you. Good. I think good to be here with you today. I don't know if it's if the, how dare you. <laughs> you're, you're next. So far. Back, dude. Oh boy, we're just here talking we about murder again. suicides. I, I, I think I think it's going to go to not the way that I thought it might be. So <laughs> we keep citing this meme. Uh, it's not really a meme. It's like one of the. It's like a text message that was circulated where a guy, a guy's wife, texted him asking him to bring home food, and he said, "No problem, Abby." And then he wrote, oh, "Baby." No underneath it and then it said oh boy here we go underneath it with oh, and like man. the dots of her typing back i loved that so oh no <laughs> i actually dude i actually called my ex-fiance her sister's name once oh no uh, which is so fucked because like like her and her sister was younger too and she was oh, and, no. she, and she was a little prettier i have to i have to say <laughs> uh, and it, and and when i said it i was like oh 
fuck <laughs> because, because I, <laughs> and, and it was during like a like not during sex but it was like during like a fairly intimate time so oh boy like, oh, i'm so fucked oh dude. no <laughs> all right on that note time to go thank you for being here patreon.com slash last stand media for early free access etc last stand media dot store for merch we'll see you next time until then goodbye constellation is a product of last stand media and collins last stand llc and is proudly recorded in the usa the show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is my brother, Dagan Moriarty. The show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman, and is edited by associate producer, Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez, and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 